Hi, my name is Davy Hughes. I'm a conservationist and expert hunter with an insatiable appetite for adventure and the great outdoors. In this series, I'm going to take you along with me as I face some very different and exciting challenges. Join me as I discover some of the most spectacular and far-flung corners of the globe. Watch me fish Alaskan salmon, hunt and track, sled, kayak, and front up to a grizzly bear. Live life to the full, live it to the max. Come along for the ride. Come on, let's go. Alaska. I can't seem to stay away from this place. Although strangely enough, even though I've been here 14 times, it's the first time that I've ever visited Kodiak Island. Just off the south coast of Alaska, two thirds of Kodiak Island is a national wildlife refuge, the largest pristine island ecosystem in North America, and home to a fiercely independent people. People who make their living out of fishing, whether it's for salmon or the Alaskan king crab, in fact, many of the crews that were on the deadliest catch are actually based here in Kodiak. Now that's a set of wheels. Another interesting fact about this island is that it's home to over 3,000 brown bears. That's the largest population density of brown bears anywhere in the world. I'm standing here in the foyer of our hotel in Kodiak and behind me is a Kodiak brown bear. It's 10 foot 10 inches from the tip of its nose all the way to its tail and weighs about 1300 pounds. That's half a ton I guess. This particular bear was shot two or three miles outside of town by my good friend Tim Booch. I just cannot get over the size of it. But more on bears later, because I've got a plane to catch to Muncie's bear camp. A de Havilland beaver float plane to be exact. Alright guys, um... We need to weigh you up for the beaver here. We have 1,200 pounds you can get on there, so. Stand in the corners, we won't weigh half as much. <laughs> <laughs> These little planes are absolute workhorses, and I reckon one of the most beautiful things in the world. Hundreds of them are still reliably transporting cargo and passengers every day. Kodiak has fjords, glacial valleys, mountain ranges studded with lakes, rivers, wetlands, spruce forests, tundra and alpine meadows. Together, all these habitats sustain 3,000 bears, more than 400 breeding pairs of bald eagles, and provide essential migration and breeding grounds for another 250 species of fish, birds and mammals. Bear hunting is permitted on Kodiak, but only during spring and autumn and is strictly controlled. Although my main purpose here is to go on an alpine hunt for mountain goat, I still really want to see a Kodiak bear up close. To keen hunters worldwide, Muncie's camp is famous. When I was a young man, I read books about this place. It's a big tick on my bucket list to be here. It may not look like much, but let me tell you, it's mighty welcoming and comfortable, and I immediately feel right at home. Well, there goes the only way in and out of here. Muncie's was started by Mike Muncie's parents back in 1956, when it was just one gold miner's shack. And over the years, the family survived 30 below winters, no electricity, and invasions by bears. We came back one time and there was a sow and a cub living in the house. And um, they, uh, it looked, we looked in through the window and it looked like uh, a propane bottle had exploded, is oh, what, it, what it looked like. The uh, place was just absolutely destroyed. They were sitting on the table, eating the tablecloth because they were so uh, hungry. I like just the pristine beauty of it and the, the isolation. I love just uh, not hearing any uh, outboards or engines of any kind. And I noticed that you do have a people. lawnmower. We do have a lawnmower, but at least we can decide when we want to hear that noise. There's daylight to burn, 
So Mike sends me off with a couple of his guides, round the bay to an inlet fed by just one of Kodiak's 117 salmon-bearing streams. Salmon is a hugely important source of income to the islanders. Their fishing fleet catches around 30 million of the king salmon annually. This stunning spot is the Brown Lagoon River. And the boys tell me it's jam-packed with hungry coho, or silver salmon, just waiting for a nice shiny lure to be dropped in front of them. They'll be queuing up, they tell me. For about an hour we fish, cast, reel in, cast, reel in, nothing. Those salmon must be queuing up somewhere else. We found a really nice pool here and it's got, got quite a good number of fish in it. Some of them look a little bit red, maybe, you know, they're starting to spawn, but we'll give it a go and see if we can pull something out. Ryan's offered the use of one of his favourite lures. This is just kind of old standard for me. It's a Panther Martin spinning lure. Something with a little bit of flash. Well, that lure sure as hell did the trick. There are five separate species of salmon on Kodiak. King, pink, red, dog, and this one, the silver salmon. The silvers are coming into their spawning season when they change color and develop bright red sides. So any we catch, we'll be letting go again. Beautiful fish. It's actually in really good condition, eh? Yeah. You can see the beginning of colour on its flanks. Certainly a feisty wee beggar. We'll let him go so he can go about his business and we'll go about ours. Two days of heavy weather have kept me stuck in camp. It rained all last night, and today it's still windy, cold and damp. Mike and assistant guide Elias have been waiting to take me on another adventure, to hunt the wild mountain goat that was introduced to Kodiak Island about 70 years ago. Now that the forecast is for more settled weather, we can set off, round the inlets of Uyak Bay, where it's common to see fin whales lazily cruising, and across to the south side, to be dropped off on the edge of the 1.9 million acre Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge. The rest of the journey will be on foot and starts with a steep climb up slippery hills to get over to the valley that ends at the mist-shrouded mountains. Ooh, a bit of a slope. It's tough going, stuff, isn't right? it? Hey, picked up a salmon berry on the way. Give it a try. Good nutrition. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a little bit leery of uh, people bearing fruits in the, in the bush, I'm afraid, mate. Yeah, but, these, are, um, these are good. Bears love them. I wonder if this is another poison fruit trick. Like the one in Tanzania. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> mm, good. That, that's pretty good. In actual fact, that's really good. I couldn't send you back down the hill to, to get some more no, from you. No, no. So, onwards and upwards we go. To save us lugging it all the way up here, the camping gear has been airdropped in bags the day before, near where we mean to make camp. You see where these creeks come down base of that uh, valley back there that's that's where the bag should be so hopefully as long as mother nature and bears left it alone overnight it should be fine <clears throat> and there could be goats anywhere along that ridge up above the above the valley there some fresh snow too mike eh? yeah yeah there is for a landscape that has a pretty harsh climate the plant life is astonishing lichens fireweed wild parsnip, and crowberries that used to be a vital part of the Inuit diet. To cross the valley, we have to fight through dense willow, trying not to step in the deep potholes hidden by the tundra, an easy way to break an ankle. As we work our way up the valley, bad weather steadily comes down to meet us. And even though it's not all that cold, before long we need a waterproof layer on because here comes heavy sleet. Now we're really hunting, according to Mike. As we continue on, the sleet turns to snow, sweeping down the valley. I'm loving this. 
Maybe it's my Scottish heritage or my New Zealand upbringing. This landscape reminds me of both places, and I feel alive and at home here. Well, we'll set up camp right over here, and uh, we'll leave our packs and gear here, and we'll go up and find our, our camp, our airdrop. Inside the bags are our food, tents, and cooking equipment, and the beaver dropped them right on the money. Food. When we eventually break camp, we'll repack these bags and leave them up here. At the end of the season, Mike's guides will come and collect them. Back at the campsite, Mike, Elias, and I need to get these tents set up quickly and a brew going before dusk. As daylight fades, the temperature up here will drop fast. The old fingers are a little bit cold here. There's a bit of a breeze coming through. It makes setting up a bit hard. And the other thing is these are American tents, so they left-hand drive. And you just got to get used to them. Oh, that's a beautiful backdrop to have your camp set up underneath. We already had a hot cup of coffee, which is good because I was pretty cold. That snow certainly cooled me down a wee bit. The day's pretty well drawing to an end, so we're going to have dinner in probably about half an hour. Chilly. Mike's been up with the spotting scope and already he's seen some mountain goats high up on the peaks above the camp here. So our plan's going to be first thing in the morning, while it's still dark, we're going to sneak up, see if we can get in close to those bluffs. And then as the daylight dawns, we'll be able to have a good look over those goats, if they're still there, of course. And with a bit of luck, there'll be a good male in amongst them. It's 6 a.m. in the morning, and my host, Mike, is already up and made coffee. Ready for a cup there, Elias? Sure. Who's ready for some coffee? You got your cup? No, but you could pour that coffee right in these boots because they are frozen solid. Morning boots, eh? That's great. One of the things that you have to put up with when you're hunting back home in the high country in New Zealand as well as here in Alaska is things do tend to freeze down a wee bit overnight. And putting your socks on in the morning is, is quite a gnarly experience and um, certainly toughens you up. Even my old boot laces are a good and stiff. <laughs> so, so it's a pretty cool sort of a morning. But we know it's going to be a grand day. And daylight reveals a magnificent vista. We're just walking up this face here and we'll cut the tracks of a, of a lame goat. He's, he's heading off the other way, so we're going to head over into this bowl that's up here behind us. Mike saw some of the goats move over to there just, just on dark last night, so hopefully they'll still be over there and just bed it down in the grass below us. When we get down to the grassy bowl, the goats have gone and the tracks have turned up towards the high ridge. But that's not all we discover. Things are getting exciting around here. We just came over that little saddle now, that lone goat that we saw down the face. Now yeah, there's maybe another dozen or so tracks just coming through this little saddle. The mice just spotted the goats just up around the corner here, so hopefully we'll be able to get the spotting scope out and have a look on these guys. And there they are, two already on the ridge line and another two heading up. If they get over that ridge, we'll have lost them. High on the slopes of the Greyback Mountains, we've come onto a group of four wild goats, one of which is an old male. They were heading up and over the ridge, and even though they've paused, they probably won't stay long. And I need to take my shot. Good shot, you got him. He's rolling. Good job. I'm pleased with that good, clean shot. Getting to the dead goat is a real mission, though. This scree is treacherous. You could break your leg or your neck if you fell. Man, look at that fur. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. 
I guess they, they really need it just to sort of get through the winters up here. Oh yeah, this is only October and it's already snow on the ground and chilly. You can imagine what they go through in February and March. So pretty amazing. You spend a day waiting for weather and a day getting up here for a, an hour of hunting. <laughs> <laughs> well, every now and then the hunter does need a little bit of luck. And I think us coming across this guy so early in the morning was extremely lucky on our behalf. Thank you, Mr. Goat. As Mike and Elias skin and dress the goat, then pack up the meat, ravens arrive, swooping and circling, dogfighting to claim territorial advantage over the kill site and any scraps we might leave behind. You know, a lot of people go to their local supermarket, head to the meat section and buy a pack of beef or pork or chicken, and that's extremely convenient. This happens to be my preferred way of getting my meat. All we will leave of the goat are bones and gut, and the ravens and any hungry bears are welcome to those. Homer's a hunter from the hill, and in his pack of the stars, the moon and the sky. I love that line. Certainly if you want to be an alpine hunter, it is a pretty hard sort of a a recreation if you like, you've got to get up early, you've got to be away before it's light and then when you're up on the hill you're contending with the with the cold and all of the elements but the payback is more than worth it to, to be up there this morning and look out on this valley and just see all the green hills and way down in the distance we can see the ocean so you know views like that I'll get out of bed early any day for that. But there's no time to be getting too philosophical. The barometer's dropping and it's clouding over. So we immediately set about pulling down the camp because signs are if a snowstorm comes, it'll be worse than yesterday's and we'll need to get below the snow line before it hits. We'll head on down the mountain now. Get a pick up on the beach. Should be back in the lodge in what, four or five hours? As soon as we descend, the weather not only holds off, but clears into a spectacular afternoon. Well, it didn't seem so steep going up, which is a strange sort of a thing, but coming down, man, she was, uh, I guess we got a lot more weight on coming down as well. But yeah, I slid over once or twice on my ass coming through some of that thick stuff. On the boat ride home, the sun brings out both the beauty of the silent and the wildlife. Eagles are as common as seagulls and seal. Sitka black-tailed deer were introduced in the early 1900s from Alaska and now number over 60,000. Plus, we get a rare glimpse of a native fox. Man, it's going to be hard to leave this place. This is my last day here on Kodiak. Mike and Elias are taking me to a salmon river not far from Muncie's camp, where they've promised to treat me to something special. The fact that both guides are carrying rifles suggests that they've brought me to bear territory. And as we creep towards a shallow spot in the river, there is one big brown beauty of a Kodiak bear. The Kodiak grizzly is one of the largest subspecies of bear and is generally solitary and shy of contact with humans. The exceptions to this behavior are when they are surprised, threatened, were attracted by food, particularly if they're starving. The last fatal brown bear attack on a person on the Kodiak archipelago was back in 1999. That's really cool. It's about 30, 40 yards away. It's a really big old boar. And uh, he just seems quite happy merging around on the riverbed here. Uh-oh. He's picked up on the noise of my camera. How's he gonna react? Mike brought us in downwind, so hopefully that big nose won't smell us. He sort of came down and I 
I almost felt like he got a whiff for us, or he was scenting and, mm -hmm. and looking across at us, but we were kind of hidden behind those logs, and uh, we're pretty tolerant until we walk out in the open or something. I come up here in the summer when the salmon are running, and it's just thick with pink salmon and just bears all over the place feeding on them, and they're pretty tolerant. <laughs> Have you ever had any um, any problems where you know things haven't gone perfectly well? And... Oh yeah, over the years you have uh, situations that you have to deal with. Um, you don't want to get too close to sows with cubs, especially young cubs, and sometimes you can't help it. Maybe they come out of the brush closer to you than, yeah. than they anticipate and you anticipate, and you have to deal with the situation. Well one thing's for sure, you've, you've got to have your wits about you when you're strolling up rivers like this and the bears absolutely, are down feeding. Absolutely, and it's so thick here, the brush is so thick that you could have bears 50 feet from you in that brush and you wouldn't know it and, and they don't know it until everyone's too close. That guy was quiet. Yeah, really yeah quiet. just completely silent until he started going through the brush a little bit, you could hear him, but oh. uh, yeah, very slow and deliberate and just silent. Mm. I'm blown away by that encounter, and this unique, stunning location still has one more surprise for me. On the boat ride back, another bonus, up close and personal with a small pod of fin whales. Actually the second largest whale next to the blue whale, and they're here all year, they don't migrate, they just stay here in the bay, feeding on krill. They get up to 80 feet long. They're beautiful, beautiful animals. A few years back, I appeared on a New Zealand television program that featured some pretty candid footage of me on a grizzly bear hunt in Alaska. Not sure how viewers would react. I was pleased when the response to that program was overwhelmingly positive but there was one letter that stayed with me. The writer told me he could accept my hunting a bear in the wild if I'd have done it with a spear. That really got me thinking, and so I've returned to that part of southeastern Alaska known as the Panhandle. This idyllic outpost of civilization is Port Alexander on Baranoff Island. The only way in and out is by boat or seaplane. No roads. Even the morning school bus is waterborne. I've travelled here to enlist the help of my crazy friend, Jim Boyce, who I've known for years, and his dog Speedy, a small terrier who thinks he's a big wolf. Jim's sturdy boat Gunsmoke will be our base camp and transport for the adventure. And leaving Jim's home in Port Alexander, we'll cross the Chatham Straits to Kuyu Island, one of the hundreds off the southeastern coast of the Gulf of Alaska. Out through the straits and into the great unknown. When we get there, the weather is closed in. Not ideal for tracking or spear hunting, but we jump in the skiff anyway and cruise up one of the many inlets on Kuyu. All of Kuyu Island is part of the Tongass National Forest the largest national forest in the United States, and remote enough to be home to many species of rare and endangered flora and fauna, one of which we hope to get a look at, the Alaskan wolf. The wolves have a den up there on the hill. They got some, they got some caves up there. We hear them up there howling quite often. Jim's an ex-US Navy SEAL, who's lived and hunted in the Panhandle for 20 years, after returning home from serving in Vietnam, he sold his only possession, his chainsaw, to buy a one-way ticket to Alaska. He's now an Alaskan master guide and a caller of wolves. Recently, the number of wolves on Kuyu has increased dramatically. There are more packs competing for the same space and greater numbers of wolves per pack. Once typically four or five animals, most packs are now over double that, and the impact on the food supply is taking its toll. The wolves have decimated the Sitka black-tailed deer population and have taken to attacking and killing bears. 
While Jim tries a distressed deer call to bring them out, I keep the rifle ready in case a pack should descend on us. We wait an hour, but still no show from the wolves. The weather has really improved, but we didn't bring the spears. So Jim takes me up a stream and then inland to show me the variety of what is actually temperate rainforest. Wolf tracks. Looks like a youngster, just a young wolf. We'll go and head up and see if we can get up to the, the beaver dam up this wee salmon stream. We go quietly because wolves could still be near. And there's certainly plenty of signs to suggest two or three have been foraging here. Then, in the middle of the forest, an artificial lake, but not built by man. It's pretty amazing that a creature that weighs 40, 50 pounds, about a metre long, can create a lake. This built, just the engineering that's gone into it. So I can have a look and see the size of some of the trees that have actually chewed down. How do they figure it out? Busy beavers. As we carry on up a river thick with spawning salmon and lined with huckleberry and fir trees, it occurs to both Jim and I this would be a great spot for a bear to feed. And sure enough, in a quiet pool, we find a fish with a bite taken out of it. Maybe it's the same bear that Speedy has smelt ever since we've been here. Cautiously, we all follow Speedy's nose into the clearing. Then Jim sights a shape up ahead. It's a young female black bear, casually carrying away two fish in her mouth. We won't follow it, so we don't disturb its meal. Just as I learnt on Svalbard, a handgun is the best last defence against a bear. And Jim's weapon of choice is this 454 Kassoul, a rugged, reliable five shot. Not like the old six shooters. I'm dying to have a shot with it. Kicks like a mule, though. I shoot over it? Yeah. Not under it? Yeah. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Later that afternoon, back on Gunsmoke, the presence of otters might mean fish. Yep, yep, a little bit more, a little bit more. Stop! Well, Jim's told us, X marks the spot, we're right above it. We don't get too many days like this in South East Alaska. When you do, you enjoy them. Woohoo! Check it out! A bite! It's a quill back. <laughs> Name is, but. Why are they called, called quill backs? Obviously. They have poison in their quills that'll uh, affect your nervous system, so you don't want to get stabbed. But they eat good, make great sashimi. We'll have a little wasabi tonight for us fish. With a soundtrack of far off wolves, we share the evening with a couple of lazy seals. Sunrise in Lover's Cove. The spears I've brought to Alaska are based on the type used by the Samburu warriors of northern Kenya. They're made from carbon steel and break down into three sections that will fit in my gun case. And of this sea air need to be kept well oiled. The old uh, rust creeps up pretty quickly. The otters are back. It was a 
time back in Alaska's history when the, the fur trade was booming, especially in this area here. Way back then, of course, Alaska was actually owned by the Russians and the, the sea otter was one of the prime economic drivers for the Russians actually being here. And then once the, uh, the sea otters began to decline in numbers, the Russians thought, hmm, it's not much worth having in Alaska, is there? So that's, um, that's probably why they decided to sell it to the Americans. That sale happened back in 1867, and the Americans weren't sure about the value of the place either. Since then, Alaska has established logging, coal mining, oil, gas, and of course, fishing industries. Today, well, today is a day I go bear hunting, armed only with that spear. I'll be relying heavily on Jim's knowledge, tracking skills, and as a backup, his accuracy with that handgun. As we creep past a bay, I spot signs of life. A female black bear browsing on kelp, right on the beach. Her two cubs were out of sight in the forest. I guess they've come out to see what food mum's found. Black bears are omnivores. They'll eat meat, fish, berries, even kelp and grasses. Speedy, time for your swazi. And time for me to go bear hunting. Custom made for you by the fellow that's in the boat here. Okay. The Athabascan Indians of Alaska would send their young braves out to face a bear with a spear as a rite of passage into manhood. Is this what the letter writer was challenging me to do? Go into the hills and get within throwing distance of a black bear and hold my nerve? Get it wrong and I could end up as a bear's dinner, like one of these salmon. Guess there's only one way to find out. We've got a short walk to the river we'll follow, away from the shoreline through some forest. And immediately on entering the first clearing, we sight the two cubs we saw earlier, now up a tree. But where's their mother, the sow? There, at the bottom of the next tree, keeping an eye on them. Mother black bears are notoriously fearsome, especially if they have any concern for a cub's safety. So we'll need to stay quiet and alert and keep a safe distance. Unlike the larger brown bear, black bears are excellent tree climbers. The sow must have heard us coming through the forest and fortunately chose to climb rather than attack. I'm just getting a little bit nervous and uh, the cubs are starting to ball a wee bit, so we'll probably make a bit of a retreat here and, and give them some space. Great to get that close though. Jim's chosen to follow this particular river for its abundance of salmon. Just as they are on Kodiak Island, salmon are the lifeblood of this area. And I chose this time of year to attempt my bear hunt because now is the salmon spawning season. Every year, thousands of these kings arrive from the ocean and fight up estuaries, rivers and streams to millennia-old spawning grounds where they then lay their eggs. Once that evolutionary role has been accomplished, the males go off to seek additional mates, while the females guard the eggs for up to a month before dying. Of course, the bears also know what season it is, and they play their part in the cycle of life by stocking up on the fat salmon in preparation for the oncoming winter. We slowly pick our way through ancient cedar and spruce rainforest. Trees here have been carbon dated back to hundreds of years BC. Mm -hmm. 
This is chicken of the woods. It's a highly prized fungus that grows here in Southeast Alaska. If you break a chunk off, you just trim the outside edges off and saute those up. It's really, really very good to eat. About an hour up the river, we find a perfect feeding site for a bear, a beaver dammed pool, well stocked with fresh salmon. Really close is right. A big male black bear heading directly my way. Around one more bend and he'll be right below me. I'll wait for him to get within seven meters before throwing. Oh, jeez, Speedy! A spectacular morning signals my last full day in southeast Alaska. Fresh brew, mate? I ain't top notch, mate. I genuinely reckon you haven't lived unless you've spent a night on board a boat and woken up to the smell of fresh coffee, bacon, eggs, and sea air. Someone once wrote, the cure for anything is salt water, tears, sweat, or the sea. So today will be my last chance to get close to a bear with a spear. The weather forecast for the next 48 hours is not at all looking good. 25 foot waves out in the ocean and a big swell nearer the coast will mean getting in and out of these small bays will become pretty tough. We're hoping to come across a bear soon, not too far up one of these streams. Meanwhile, just slipping quietly through this magnificent forest is magic. That's a juvenile bald eagle, watched over by an adult. Jim's leading me to another great bear feeding spot. Plenty of fresh salmon and blueberry bushes, which Speedy obviously recommends. Oh, not bad. Mm. Pretty good. With the amount of food available to them, the bears in this area can afford to be pretty fussy eaters, and sometimes only eating the brains or skin of a fish. There are no tidy, well-marked trails in the wilderness, so following a river is an age-old technique for making progress. Even then, the forest produces obstacles. And there's the ever-present danger of running into a hidden bear. There goes Speedy's nose again. He's found these bear droppings full of blueberries. Very fresh. And uh, there's been one or two bears just working this area, feeding on it. Might go and see if we can get a little ambush spot, just a wee bit further up the creek. Find a nice bank to um, look out on the feeding spots. As we continue, we discover more bear sign. Jim senses we're close, and I decide it's prudent to check the direction of the wind in case he smells us before we see him. Further up the river, these rapids provide an excellent opportunity to again study the frantic charge of spawning salmon. These amazing fish can swim up to 3,000 kilometers from the ocean to their ideal spawning grounds, pre-programmed into their DNA, like a set of GPS coordinates. 
Man, I can't believe how much energy these salmon expend just to get up these falls and to get up this river to spawn. That energy comes from the stored omega-3 fatty acids this fish is so prized for. Once again, Jim's uncanny skills have got us right onto a bear. Just figuring out where's a good spot to sort of lay up. And I turn around and he's about 15 yards away, just looking straight at us, a nice big bear. Looking this way, but not noticing us. Berries, pool of salmon, what more could a bear ask for? And he's a mature male, taking its time to fish for the best salmon. The black bear is the smallest and most abundant of the North American bears. It can still weigh up to about 159 kilos. And QU Island has the highest known density of them. They have only adequate senses of sight and hearing, but an outstanding sense of smell. Black bears normally work their way downstream when fishing to meet the salmon head on, which should bring this one directly below where I'm waiting trying to stay calm. Loosen your grip. Roll back your thumb, balance. Don't snatch at the throw. Guide the spear. Imagine the path of its flight. Whew. Here he comes, getting closer and closer. Has he sensed me? I don't think so. <laughs> oh well, Bears 3, Davey no. <laughs> that was pretty cool. <laughs> Not for a second do I feel this trip was a failure though. I wanted an adventure that would test my skills as a hunter. My courage as a man. I got that adventure and much more. Time spent with a good mate and a fellow hunter in an environment which not many people get to experience. The forest and the distant howl of wolves and a look of annoyance on that bear's face. You have to leave your comfort zone and get into the wild to enjoy that. Last week I was in southeastern Alaska. Here, across the border, is the vast Yukon Territory of Canada's northwest. Yukon, the very name is evocative of adventure and discovery. To me as a kid it was a magic word. From the lives of the First Nations people, to the explorers and fur trappers, and the prospectors, thousands of them, who rushed to the Klondike in 1896 in search of a fortune in gold. My adventure is to experience something of the old way of hunting moose in the Yukon wilderness, trekking on horseback along tangled trails, fording icy rivers, and carrying all the equipment and supplies on eight of these hardy, unflappable pack horses. This trail hasn't been travelled for two or three years, and it's well overgrown. Sure enough, a couple of the pack horses take a wrong turn and get tangled up with a tree and themselves. Bit of drama on the trail. <laughs> Come on, boy. Wow, really saggy bottoms. The Klondike River is a tributary to the mighty Yukon River, and where they meet at Dawson City was the heart of the gold rush in the 1890s. Shake it, and it keeps it in the bottom, because it's 19 times heavier than water. An estimated 100,000 prospectors set off to the Klondike region. Only 30 to 40,000 of them made it, and of them, only around 4,000 actually struck gold. Where am I gonna find a big nugget? Big nuggets? Yeah. Well, they may, they might be here. They might be. Yeah. Generally, they find them. Oh, now you're trying to uh, bribe me, are yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I see how you work. 
Today it's mostly tourists who try their luck here, also to come away empty-handed. The Yukon's a wild, remote place. It's not an area you go into without the experience of a local guide. Billy Sunderluck is a real mountain man, born and bred in the Yukon. Six hours in the saddle, we arrive at our camp. Hey, mate. We only just beat the darkness. Looking forward to uh, getting the fire going, but we get all these horses unpacked, and then, then we can heat ourselves up. The temperature goes down as quickly as the sun. We need to unpack not only the gear and food for ourselves, but feed for the horses too. An unnatural racket breaks the peace of a bright, icy morning. It's what they call 10 day, and every 10 days, they have a wash, they have a shower, and they wash their dirty clothes. From the colour of that water, it looks more like 20 day. Today, while members of another party pack up and move on, Bill and I get to go looking for moose up along the ridge above. As we gain height, a shower of sleet comes down to greet us. Bill knows there'll be snow right behind it, so we'll tether the horses below tree line and carry on to higher ground on foot. A strange thing about moose is that the more snow you get, the higher up they go, because that's where the taller red brush sticks up out of the snow and provides a source of nutrition. It's early October now, beginning of winter. By the end of the month, all the rivers in the Klondike region will have iced over, and a period of intense cold will begin for seven long months. One good thing about this snow is that it'll make seeing moose tracks easier and determining whether it's a bull or a cow. Snow showers will come and go all day up here. Hunting's not just all about walking and covering great distances. Often it's finding a good vantage point somewhere a little bit high where you can look down and then just glass it. And it becomes a game of patience, really. When it's minus five and everything is cold, and your poor old nose is starting to run. But that's hunting. I actually love it. Bill uses the moose hunter's not-so-secret weapon, the moose call. Snow is starting to ease. And where at first I just thought, we're at the top of a small terrace. There's an amazing valley system down below us. And it looks, looks like awesome hunting country, especially for moose. They're probably about 200 metres this side of the ridge. You know, when you see a moose, you see like one paddle or something like yeah. this. This is two. And um, and they actually look very paddle shaped. But I've been, I've been watching them now for about 10 or 15 minutes and they haven't moved at all. Sometimes they can just sit there and not move for a few months away. They'll just sit there and for a long time. For a long time. Moose. They do that. I don't know if that really was a moose in the trees or not. But not to worry, a great day in the mountains and a stunning sunset to ride back to camp in. And the day has one more surprise, a light show of charged particles bouncing off atoms in the high altitude atmosphere. I've seen the Aurora Borealis before in Norway, but this, this is brighter with many, many more colours. Wow. Oh. What a day. God, it's absolutely gorgeous. After days of battling snow and wind, to wake up to a beautiful morning like this and know that we've got the whole day on the mountain, man, couldn't be in a better place. And what would lift my spirits even further? 
Well, the sight of a nice big Yukon moose would do the trick. Sometimes, you know, you, you'll find yourself on a hill and, and you're just glassing over country. Even country as beautiful as this and your mind starts to wander. Gives you a chance to look at issues and challenges, maybe, maybe look at things from a different perspective. Just really think about life in general, people. Well, sometimes that thought is, is simple and it might just be looking at a fir tree with a little dusting of snow on it and thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, it's perfect. Yep, perfectly empty. There's over 70,000 moose in the Yukon. The country's so vast that they're proving incredibly elusive to find. I mean, we've been on the trail for days now. While we've come across sign, we haven't seen a single moose. What's the story, mate? Are the moose hibernating? Well, they might be. Hold up for the bears. Have you got a, a secret honey hole that you uh, want to take us to? A little bit of one just over here. We'll find out. I've I've caught them over there before. Hopefully we can catch them over there again. Bill says this year the caribou have left two weeks earlier than usual. Seems the moose have done the same. Tell you what, I didn't think I would be, but I'm really glad that I'm on a horse, especially the last couple of days with the snow. And uh, this morning the snow's quite a bit deep up here. So it's hard going. I mean, just that we walk up the hill is sort of taking my breath away. So a horse with his long legs, and a good horse, Whew, thank goodness for that. But we won't be taking the horses up this. Bill's honey hole for moose is just on the other side of this rise. And he says, just a quick clamber over this hill. But I can tell you now, these rocks, that ain't no clamber, I know clamber. This is a mission. These slopes of rubble are formed from erosion by water, then fracturing by frost, leaving these large shards of rock. But make it to the top, and the view alone is well worth the effort. Well, that wasn't as bad as I thought. This hill has been clambered. The earth is a beautiful place, isn't it? You've just got to get off the sofa and go take a look. Sometimes it comes a time in a hunt when you have to make a call. Should you stay or should you go? And when one minute it's a beautiful sunny day and the next it turns to crap, it's time to go. Bill was on the sat phone yesterday and heard that only 25% of the 80-odd different hunting parties presently in the Yukon have had any luck with moose. We figure the moose have moved on from this valley, so we should go too. No regrets. These horses um, are incredibly sure-footed, and uh, certainly going uphill is, is not a problem, but coming downhill with this fresh snow and there's actually ice underneath it now as well, it, um, it actually pays to, to lead them. The horses don't mind. Another day, another hunt. Tomorrow we'll pack this camp and start the seven hour trip back down to the main camp on Thannon River. Last night Bill and I got talking, came up with a plan. Leave early on foot, and this time head down, away from the hills into the tundra-covered valley, for one last hunt before we have to ride out. We're doing this not because we have a desperate need to kill something, but because, like me, Bill finds hunting makes him whole. 
something clicks inside, and those primal emotions hardwired into all humans give you a sense of belonging in the wilderness. And hallelujah, in the boggy swamp, we find moose sign, finally. You can see last night we had a bit of a frost, and this moose print is crushing the ice down into its track. So it's very fresh this morning. Just look at the size of this print. There's a moose loose about this house, and it's very, very close. We need to get out of the swamp now and up to higher ground because we want to be looking down on whatever's out there. Just heard something uh, over there. Sounds like a moose moving. Yes, right there. Huffing and puffing its way through the brush. But it's not a moose. Caribou bomb. It's about 100 metres down here below us. Actually, he's coming, he's, he's walking straight towards us. This will be really interesting. I wonder, wonder what he'll do when he sees us. I think he has seen us, but doesn't appear too bothered. He just turns and wanders off in the spruce, apparently sensing he's in no danger from us. The Yukon certainly wins prizes for its scenery, and I'm grateful for the sense of freedom and camaraderie I've experienced here, but had no luck with the hunt. Then, an idea. Why not go back to Alaska and try my luck with the moose there? Ah yes, my adventure's not over yet. Another ride in a tiny plane, another bumpy but safe landing. And here we are, back in the USA's 49th state, Alaska. Thanks man, how are you Yeah. <laughs> Good landing, Barney. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Awesome's an understatement. This is Bobby Fivian's hunting camp, a collection of simple wood and canvas cabins in Emerald Valley. And that's George. He'll be my guide for my latest adventure. This place has the most spectacular views from wherever you're sitting. Well, it's Alaska and it's the wilderness, so there's two things that you'll need. Number one, and then a little bit of extra protection. Because just sitting in front of me is a rub tree where a grizzly was rubbing up on last night, so uh, I just brought this along just in case because here's an example of what a hungry grizzly will do in search of food. We're in South Central Alaska, 142,000 square kilometers of grizzly and black bear country, along with wild sheep and of course, moose. A country where it pays to be self-sufficient and innovative. Let's see how it feels. Perfect, huh? Yeah, it's fine, man. Maybe that's a new Swazi item. Combination gear. Gee, thanks, Bob. <laughs> Today, George has taken me into the high tundra valley in the Kuskokwim area of South Central. This is prime moose country, and even though our main goal for the day is to just get to our campsite in the hills and set up for the evening, we'll try a bit of moose calling at dusk to see what's in the area. George came to Alaska when he was 19, lured by the opportunity of an outdoors life. Now, just a few years later, he's worked his way up to Alaskan Master Guide. Look at those oh. vistas. Just like something out of a John Ford Western. Oh. Oh. At sundown, George tries a few mail calls. And right near camp, we get a fleeting glimpse of a young bull, much too young to shoot. 
First day here, and already we've seen a moose. As I head off to bed, I'm full of excitement for tomorrow. The sun rises on a world where technology seems completely out of place. George and I were up at first light and off into the hills to look for moose. And within a couple of hours, we see a good one, almost invisible in thick willow. I don't think he can see us here, but just to make sure, swing around this knob here and drop down in this bottom of this little jaw. Then I know we're safe. After a period of depressed numbers, the moose population in this area is again on the increase. Just as Jim explained in the Alaskan southeast, wolves were the main problem. In this region, an aerial culling was used to control the wolf population. But when that was suspended, the number of moose quickly shrunk. So to restore balance, a short wolf cull was reinstated and the moose recovered. Moose have great senses of hearing, smell and eyesight. And if we want to get close, we'll need to stay upwind, keep low and make no noise. We managed to get within 20 metres. That's close. Then the bull spots us and takes off across the valley floor into Willow. That was a big moose and a good 60 inch antler spread, but young. So we've already decided it was not an animal we'd shoot. Thrilled to get that close though. Climbing high, it's not long before we spot another bull. And we've just, just spotted him down against the base of the hill. He looks like quite an old bull, past his prime, going back down, so that's, that's a hunter. Sometimes that's the best animal to take. Scraping a horn against a tree mimics the sound of a moose cleaning its antlers. There's a cow down there too, so George mixes in some cow and calf calls. All of which seem to have got the moose to stop and turn, which gives me my chance. Definitely an old bull, 12 to 13 years old. You get him, baby, but I want you to keep shooting. The cow leaves in a hurry, and we go back down into the red willows to take a look at the animal I've shot. For me, true hunting is not just about providing meat. It's also about learning which animal to take. By removing those past their prime, you can create space and food for the next generation. And you can see how old this one is by the widespread of his antlers and how worn those tips are. This old bull will still be used for his meat, and I appreciate him for that. It's been an amazing couple of weeks, crisscrossing between Alaska and Canada. The land, the hunting, but more than anything, the people, their companionship and their humour. Wishing my gal was by my side. Since childhood, my dream has been to follow in the footsteps of my heroes, Speak, Burton, Stanley and Samuel Baker, all hunters and explorers of the vast continent of Africa. My destination is the huge 55,000 square kilometre Salu Game Reserve in Tanzania. And my goal is to hunt the Cape Buffalo, one of the big five game animals and probably the most dangerous. Of course, I'll need an experienced guide for this adventure. Unfortunately, I've got one of the best, Richard Bonham. He's been running safaris in this part of the world for over 30 years. Hey, Richard, how are you, mate? Hey, really good to see you. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, what a great flight in. Yeah, it was beautiful country. Did you go over the river there? Yeah, no, we did. We had one of the most awesome flights in. So oh, it was just great. fantastic. 
It's important to me that we go on the safari, not in the modern style, riding all the way in jeeps and sleeping in luxury lodges, but the way the first adventurers did it, on foot, with porters to carry all the necessary food and equipment from camp to camp. This will be longer, hotter and harder, but for me, it's the only way I could possibly do this. These guys are all locals. Not only will this provide a good income for them, they also get an equal share in any of the meat we kill. These are people who probably only eat meat once or twice a year. We're heading across the Rafiji River now. It's quite a deep, wide river. I've got a few uh, hippos floating about, so we'll just take a little care. What seems like a calm, peaceful river is a pretty good example of how you never take this country for granted. Richards just told me one of the porters who was to be on this trip was killed by a croc while he was fishing here just two days ago. We set off, but no sooner have we hit the bush than we find a dead elephant. A young male, poisoned or wounded by poachers, he's then escaped to die a slow death near the river. We have Nindi, a government game warden with us, and he notes the GPS coordinates of the carcass before he confiscates the tusks, so the poachers will get nothing from this animal. Over the next two weeks, we'll cover about 500 kilometers, crisscrossing the dried up bed of the Sandy River, where elephants come to drink, and beside which zebra, lion, and parlor, wildebeest, and a whole host of other creatures all hang out in the grassy plains and scattered forests. I'm not here to blaze away at anything and everything. What we kill, we eat. And we only eat what we need. Even if I don't get a single Cape buffalo, just having been here to experience this amazing place will have been well worth the trip. One really important thing is keeping silent. Once we're out there, all communications is done in whispers. Um, you know, if you want to draw my or Kani's attention, do it either with a loud whisper or a click of the fingers or and that'll, that'll draw attention to the fact that you've seen something. Okay. Sunrise, and Nindy's taking his morning dose of snuff. <coughs> <laughs> oh, the old man, this country, we, we use like this, to yeah. smoke this, because uh, our vents, or, or our, our brain, is very weak. How <laughs> 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 oh, can you do that, Indy? <laughs> <laughs> our goal this morning is to get on the track of buffalo, preferably a herd. there for safety by its mother, it won't move, but it's in danger of being found by a leopard if it stays there too long. We leave the river to search into the forest, and Carney soon has us on the track of that bull again. This is fresh, this is last night. 
Then, in the trees just ahead, we hear some movement. There's a couple of buffalo just through there. My first buffalo. My mouth's dry. Has he seen us? I can't take the shot with the foliage in the way. Even a twig could divert the bullet and only wound him. And just like that, he's gone. <sighs> that was a good looking bull too. Nice big boss, meaning he was at least seven years old. Ah oh well, tomorrow's another day. Last night, about three o'clock, <clears throat> felt something small crawling over me. I thought, oh, it's just a bug, so I flipped it away. And but two seconds later, I was, there was another bug, and I flipped that away. And then I thought, oh, there's, there's another bug, and that bug bit me. I turned the torch on, and the place was infested with ants, the walls, the roof, all inside my sleeping gear, the whole lot, and they bite. But, um, hey, it's cool to see so many ants, isn't it? The safari ants have somewhere to go, and so do we. I'm about to get stuck in the shit, literally. So this is the first thing that happens, the, the outside starts crusting over. Um, a lot depends if it's been in the shade or in the sun. You see these little holes, they're created by little um, bugs. Um, eventually dung beetles will come as well. And once you start seeing these holes in, that'll give you another. Um, gauge to, to measure it by. How long it's, before the um, bugs start putting the holes in? It can be 20 minutes. Ah. Our trail takes us from water hole to water hole, because these are where all the wildlife never stray too far from. That's a water monitor lizard, known locally as a kufu atila. Richard finds the head of a buffalo that's been killed by a lion. And the most interesting thing about it are the growths coming out of the skull. Not a plant, but the larval stage of a horn moth that only lays its eggs in the horns of dead animals. As the morning heats up and the temperature starts to climb, it's quite important that you stop and rehydrate every hour or two. Just get yourself under the shade of a big tree and just have a wee bit of a snooze and drink some hot and sweet tea. The tea kettle is always at the ready on this expedition, and it never takes our guys long to find a shady spot, set up the camp, and get the fire started and a brew going. Ha, ah, got him. There's a tetsu full of blood. So a lot of people say they're conservationist's best friend, because they keep domestic stock out of um, gay areas. They kill domestic stock. They don't affect um, wildlife. No um, threat with um, the sleeping sickness from Tetsi's fire yeah. around here? No, not the variety that affects humans. After lunch I snoozed, while Richard cleans his 470 Nitro. This classic double barreled rifle once belonged to Captain Ritchie, Chief Game Warden of Kenya. It's a beautiful gun, nearly 100 years old. Like beached whales, on a bed of leaves we rest, eating bacon, Sausages and hard boiled egg sandwiches. <laughs> Even though we wait till late afternoon to carry on, the heat is still fierce, 54 degrees. This is the sand river that we're hunting and it's actually around about 95% of the year. It's just like this and then the rest of the time in the wet season fills up with water. Certainly in the heat of the day, the sun reflects off the sand and it does make it for a pretty warm sort of a day. But Richard's got just the thing to quench a thirst. Wild pomegranate. You bring a knife. Oh, these are really good. Cool. Nindy arrives just as Carney, Richard and I all swallow a mouthful. They're the poisonous ones. No, you said this is what the poachers use to um, poison elephant. Oh, so. <laughs> Shit, the candy's all ready. <laughs> I'm about ready to panic. <laughs> I don't believe it. 
It was all just a joke instigated by Richard. Oh, I'm going to be sick on you. <laughs> yeah, and the whole lot of them were in on it. <laughs> OK, well. There's very little day left, so it's back to camp for some non-poisonous food. Louis's making bread, baked in the pot on the fire, yeah. and they turn out as beautiful rolls. We take um, water for granted because it comes out of a tap, but around here you've got to actually dig for water. We're gonna add a little bit of chlorine just to make sure it's nice and clean, but it's pretty good water, let me tell you that. Hi. The day ends with the distant echo of a lion coming to the nearby waterhole to drink. Be great if he comes close to camp and we can check him out. Next morning we're up with the bats. While we were asleep, the lion we heard came very close to camp. And we see plenty of its prints down by the waterhole. He's also found buffalo sign. A small group of animals, by the way. Following Cape Buffalo into thick bush requires extreme caution. Buffalo, in my opinion, is one of the most dangerous animals on the planet. It's a cunning and aggressive animal, which can outflank you, hide, and then charge. Every year, there are several attacks where hunters are gored and even killed. Not before we wait out this bad weather that's closed in fast. The rain's coming now. We'll have an instant regrowth here in a couple of days. We'll really help the well out. Came in very quick. A little bit of lightning. So we've ducked under this tree. I don't know, what sort of tree is this, Richard? This is a Salvadora. Salvadora tree, which um, provides some pretty good cover from the rain, actually. So we'll just sit this one out. Along with a couple of giant millipedes to keep us company. That process of fire, rain, then regrowth within days is the natural rhythm of the African bush. End of another day. A long day, really, but um, quite entertaining to say the least. A um, couple of contacts in the heavy brush, which was pretty exciting. It's good to see the camp. I'm kind of looking forward to uh, getting these wet clothes off and having a little drink. The morning of our eighth day brings mist and a kind of lethargy to the camp. Everyone's finding it hard to get going, except for me, I'm off to the toilet. But once the sun arrives, we're off. We're going to head up um, these dry riverbeds and see if we can uh, cut tracks of the herd. We saw a herd that um, had come through yesterday on the way into camp and uh, some of the porters had actually got in amongst them and they reckon it was quite a large and significant herd. So if we can catch tracks of that and just work the herd, work in and out and see if we can select ourselves a good bull, then uh, we could have a pretty fun sort of a day here. But first, some more bushcraft from Richard. This is the cold gate of the bush. You just chew the end of it and get it into a brush. And then you just scrub your teeth. Come all fibrous. Chew it. As we head away from the river into the forest, we hear an approaching engine. A government spotter plane passes overhead, looking for elephant poachers, hoping to scare them off. If there are poachers around, we want to know where they are. 
because we sure as hell don't want to walk into them. That'll be a firefight. No sign of anything. Had a good look around, but we'll just keep going and try and hit the river down here. That's a lot of vultures. Looks like there's a kill just up here in the, in the grass. Which we'll approach reasonably careful. No poachers, but a dead elephant butchered for its ivory. More, more. And two more. Killed in the last day or so. Thousands of tembo are poached annually, and record amounts of illegally traded ivory has been seized after being transported through Tanzanian and Kenyan ports. Well, as you can see here, this is a very freshly poached elephant. It's just gone straight down, so more than likely brain shot. But um, very fresh. Very fresh. We've just come across uh, three dead elephants. Such a bloody travesty. And the crazy thing is, it wouldn't take a lot of money to, to really put a halt to a lot of this poaching. For a start, it would be bloody good if the people that buy the ivory would stop buying it. Maybe it's about time as a planet we started waking up and saying, what are we doing for greed? Finding those three young elephants has dampened our mood, and we call it a day. Both Richard and I don't have much to say that evening. We just stare into the fire, looking for inspiration there. Red skies mean sunrise. We've been in the bush nine days, and this is the last full day we can hunt. If I don't succeed in getting a buffalo today, well, I just can't think about that. Very soon, we come across buffalo sign. I'm hoping we might be close, but Carney, of course, knows better. He's seen a dung beetle burrow. He's been able to do all that work indicator that we're quite a long way behind them. Still, we are on their trail, and once again I get to marvel as Carney tracks their sign through dense bush, walking himself for every twist and turn the herd has made. Got some good fresh sign here. Really hot sign, looks like a herd, quite a large herd, so they're moving Stick this way. Now it's a waiting game. I'll only shoot an old bull, and they usually stay at the back of the herd. Richard's put a follow-up shot in straight after mine. My shot felt good. The bull's gone into thick bush. We've got to be really careful now. This is a dangerous time. He might still be alive, and as we approach him, he can get up and charge. So we'll try and come in from behind him. Well done, man. <sighs> Looks a lot bigger in here than it does out there in the open. <laughs> it's an East African custom to tie a knot in the animal's tail to ward off dysentery. Do 
Don't don't worry for this paper. <laughs> the porters celebrate a clean kill and the gift of meat for their families. Celebrations that will go long into the night. I'll never forget the characters I've met on this trip and the friendships I've built. I feel I have shared the same challenges and triumphs of my heroes, walking in their footsteps two centuries later. I'm travelling a thousand kilometres north from Tromso, on mainland Norway, up to the Svalbard archipelago in the Arctic Ocean. As we get further and further north towards the Arctic Circle, the daylight rapidly slips away. I've come to Svalbard to embark on an adventure I've dreamt about for years, dog sledding in the extreme conditions of the Arctic. This already feels like a whole other world, and I'm amped up and ready to go. My first goal is to find my Arctic guide, Johan Fortun. He's a Norwegian Special Forces instructor. I've never met the guy. We've been emailing each other for about six or seven years. He's been buying Swazi gear off the net. And, uh, well, this looks like the guy. <laughs> G'day, Johan. My name's David. Yeah, good to meet you after all these years, mate. In 1920, New Zealand was signatory to the treaty which made Svalbard part of Norway. That granted New Zealanders the right to reside, fish, hunt, and even run a business on Svalbard. The town of Longyearbyen is the northernmost on our planet. Built on permafrost and iced in for eight months of the year, it's also surrounded by bears. In fact, Svalbard is known as the kingdom of the ice bear. 3,000 of them. Hilda Hella? Hella, yes. Svalbard. Yeah, it counts yeah. from the whole Svalbard. Watch out around the whole of Svalbard for polar bears. That's right. Let's get back in the truck. Along with polar fox, reindeer, whales and seals, those bears have meant Svalbard has seen tourism, trapping and hunting since the 1890s. Everywhere you look in this remote but very well equipped little town, polar bears feature. To this carnivore, humans are no different to seals. Fair game. On Svalbard, everyone learns how to handle a gun from an early age. Wherever you go in the world, what better way to get straight into the local culture than by checking out their food? It's uh, seal beef. It comes with a glaze. And it's a carrot puree. Seal. I guess back home in New Zealand, that'll be a fairly emotive sort of a subject. The fact of the matter is, people have been hunting seals for thousands of years up here in the Arctic. That's not bad. Mm, that is not bad. Although the most common mode of transport around here is the snow scooter, snow scooter it's driving a dog sled team that I came here for. And that's exactly what I intend to get straight into tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> it's a bit chilly today. It's chilly. It's yeah. tropical. Is it? Yeah, it's only minus four and you can expect 20. A bit more than 20. 20, minus. going up to 20 degrees? No, down. Down, minus, minus 20. Minus 20. Oh, OK. Robert from Svalbard Husky is going to teach me the finer art of mushing. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> Mate, I've never been on a dog sled before. Oh. No. Then you're going to try something uh, cool. Good. Yeah. You're going to put up a, a big team for you. Like 15 dogs or something? <laughs> I heard you should start on a small team. <laughs> no, you're looking like a big guy. You can do it. We start with six dogs. That's a lot of power. G'day, mate. G'day, mate. G'day, Captain Nemo. Nemo. <laughs> the sleds use a traditional wooden frame, but they've added modern plastic to the runners. Man, that runs so smooth. It's two basic, very important rules about dog sledding. First, if you fall, you don't let go of the sled. And the next rule is the first rule is important. <laughs> if you lose the team, dogs will die. Okay. They, will run, they will run and it will be an accident. 
So you can get a little bit beat up, but they, they will feel that something's wrong, so they will stop. You step on this to break. Normal regulating speed when we are going, you use this pad. You just have your feet on here and heels on here. Look how mad keen these dogs are to get going. When you've got the dog in your hand and you bring him over to the line, you can just feel the strength and they want to go, they want to go. I'm pretty sure I'm in for a wild ride. It's wild all right. The dogs just accelerate away and you really have to hang on. It's all about balance. Man, this is awesome fun. Jack London and the Call of the Wild and the wolf dog Kavik. And now I'm out here living it, doing it. What a dream. Originally, the indigenous Norwegian Sami people used reindeer to pull their sleds until the husky was introduced from Alaska and Siberia. Imagine going for hundreds of kilometres with a full team in this spectacular landscape. It's got to be the best way of Nordic travel. <laughs> Robert, I want to be a musher. <laughs> More than anything in the world, I want yeah. to be a musher. I can see why people like Rob put up with the long nights, cold weather and hard work, feeding and exercising the dogs every day. Just one trip out into the wilderness behind an eager team makes it all worthwhile. These pups are the next generation, bred specifically for dog sledding. Always when we are going to breed a dog, we are looking for leader dogs. So we look for the best parents we can get. And we breed the best female with the best uh, male. So I've had a taste of what dog sledding is about, and I want to take the next step. I think you should uh, go to um, Karoshok. Karoshok, and uh, we sit uh, Sven Engholm. I've got my next destination, back on mainland Norway, for another dog sled adventure. It's 10.30 a.m. in the morning, and the light will be gone today by 12 o'clock. By next week, it'll be dark, the polar night. These guys are not going to see daylight again until February, and it's November now. Although I'm keen to get down to Karoshok, get stuck into more dog sledding, my flight out isn't for another three days. Fortunately, Svalbard has much more to offer than just sledding. One of the last things that I expect to find in a place like this is a high-tech facility. One which has such huge global significance, and that's the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. It's often referred to around the world as the Doomsday Vault. Seed vaults only open for deposits five or six times a year. Right now there's a truck turning up with four and a half tons of seeds from all around the world. Built and paid for by the Norwegian government, the idea is that if a global crisis were to wipe out the Earth's plant life, this place would have the seeds backed up in three secure vaults, buried hundreds of metres deep into this mountain. The natural permafrost keeps the whole facility at minus four degrees Celsius, and extra artificial cooling inside the vaults keeps them at minus 18. You know, this place feels like something out of a Bond movie, all high tech and mysterious. Actually, it's free to store samples here, and so far seeds from 226 countries have been deposited into the care of Roland von Botmer. I read somewhere that there are only three species that are really important to agricultural production. That's wheat, that's rice, that's maize. 60% of the world consumption of calories are from these three species. Imagine if even just those three species of seed were lost and not backed up. It would be catastrophic for millions of people around the world. While I've been sightseeing, Jan has been organising a little trip for tomorrow, out to the seaside. Actually, it's a trip to the Sassen Fjord. Another dark morning. <laughs> a little chilly. Today, Jan and I are heading out on a snow scooter adventure, 80 kilometres away from civilization, deep into polar bear country. First stop's just up the road here. Well, it's not really a road, is it? It's kind of just a big snow expanse. We're going to call in at a kennel and we're going to grab a dog, a bear dog. 
How's that? We're really in the sticks if we need a dog to guard us from bears. Loki greets his old mate Yoan by <laughs> peeing on his leg. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I pee on you, and you know who's the boss. Local laws require that anyone who's going to leave the safety of Long Epian go out into the wild expanses of Svalbard, have to take out search and rescue insurance, and carry a weapon. Now we're in the bear country, we have to prepare the guns. Polar bear are a protected species in Norway and can only be killed in self-defense. And then the rubber slug, the white one. If you need to use it, get rid of the rubber bullet. Boom, boom, bye, bye, out, and then BBs. Yes. And this for spare, for yourself. Spare. <laughs> <laughs> Polar bear is one of the only animals that actively tracks down and kills humans. Hunger is what drives them. With their habitat shrinking from global warming, their contact with humans is becoming more common. Our route follows the frozen Advantalba River. At this time of year, the ice can be up to three metres thick, but there are shallow spots where it's thin enough for the heavily laden snow scooter to break through into the freezing water. This happened only last year to a friend of Johan's. He was on his own and never got back out. Midday, halfway there and the sun is already below the horizon. Without a GPS, it would be so easy to lose your way in this flat, flat light. The last seven or eight kilometers been through this canyon. It's kind of freaky to tell you the truth. These massive big walls either side of you. But we've emptied out into this gigantic valley. At the end of the valley is an old trapper's cabin that we're aiming to stay the night at. And eventually, a cluster of buildings loom out of the pitch black. I breathe a small sigh of relief that we've found them. The original hut is still there, built over 100 years ago from driftwood and earth. You know, there are no forests on Svalbard, so all the wood is what was washed up on the coast brought by seasonal ice flows from Russia. Guys dug all these sods of earth, put off a bit of a wooden frame, I should imagine, and then the sods have gone up against that. It's, it's got to be around about two foot thick here, probably more, probably three foot at the bottom. Get a fire inside, this thing's going to get amazing insulation, and steep too. So the snow's not going to sit on the outside, it's all just going to fall down. I think these guys really knew what they were up to. Our hut's next door, and slightly newer, Wow. This what is my kind of hut, man. Yeah. <laughs> what the difference? <laughs> Good and basic. Yeah? Yeah. This is me. I can live here all my life. It's very Shackleton, isn't it? You know, it's just old wood, things that have been rubbed and... I love old huts like this. I'm quite emotional about them. The bear alarm's already set. Johan gets the stove cranked up and I get stuck into making a decent cup of tea. Still floating. <laughs> it's a bit of ice. It's our water. <laughs> That's not the only thing that was frozen. You want that to try? You yeah, should. Sure. It's nice stuff, you see? It still is frozen. Yeah. <laughs> Reindeer meat stew in a hut just like Shackleton's. Excellent. Excellent. It's what guys like me dream about, even if it is minus 27 inside the hut. The scene that greets me in the morning is one of the most alien landscapes I think I've ever seen. The guy who built this hut was a famous Norwegian trapper, Hilmar Noyce. He spent 26 winters here. Weather today is not looking good. Constant snowstorms are creating whiteout conditions, and we need to get the hell out of here, back to town as quickly as possible. The thick snow camouflages the patches of thin ice, and 20 kilometers out, I feel it crack under me, and I'm stuck. We've got to get this machine out fast, because the snow's getting heavier, and daylight's almost gone. The old trappers navigated by the sun and stars. When they couldn't see them, they'd have to stop and wait it out in the snow. Finally, we see the lights of Longyearbyen and know we've made it. 
at the end of a long, hard slog. No time to rest, though, because my next adventure awaits, back on the mainland of Norway. The sound of hungry dogs wakes me to a stunning day in Karasjok. After the almost constant dark of Svalbard, it's great to see morning light. And it's also noticeably warmer, or perhaps I should say it's a lot less cold. The Angham Husky Lodge has 50 sled dogs, a mix of blue-eyed Siberian Husky and the brown-eyed Alaskan Husky. Both breeds are always hungry. The lodge was built by Sven Ingham. This guy's a bit of a legend in the Husky racing world. He's won the famous 1,000 kilometre Finnmark race 11 times. And he's also been a top 10 finisher in the 1,800 kilometre Iditarod. He stopped racing 10 years ago to start this place, helped by his partner Crystal, who pretty much runs everything. Yeah. Reindeer skin has been used by the indigenous Sami for centuries. It's their version of the materials I use on my Swazi gear, and it still works just as well. It's very nice, uh, neat the way that they put them together. You can see the front of the pants, just exactly here, is the knee, the front knee of the reindeer. They have a natural bend. This is Skalle. Underneath, when you walk in uphill, the hair goes this way, so you get a grip. Opposite side, when you go downhill, the hair grip behind in the snow. Clever, huh? A couple of the young guys are taking the pups out for a run this morning, so I thought I'd go along with them and have a bit of a run myself. The snow looks pretty deep, so it might be more of a sort of a, a waddle than a, than a run. They normally take the dogs out every day, but recently there have been a lot of reindeer in the area. Reindeer and huskies don't mix. The dogs chase the reindeer, and the reindeer kick back. Man, these sled dogs have got so much energy, and you can see right from an early age, these guys are bred to go. If they love meat, so we just uh, give them a food command and um, yeah, they, they'll just stay close when, and when you're feeding them. This is Sami country, and an area where they still herd reindeer for the meat, skins and profit. <laughs> That's Grandad in the middle directing the troops. He's only 82. To the Sami, reindeer is like currency. The size of each family's herd is a measure of wealth. We've finished drafting after midnight, but it's back to their tent, called a lavu, for a cup of tea. And yep, you guessed it. Reindeer? Yes, it's reindeer. <laughs> Tastes like chicken. Not the same as chicken. A fresh dump of snow overnight makes conditions perfect for dog sledding. I'm starting to pick a few of the dogs out and recognise them. There's Tony over here. He's a lead dog and he's a really strong wolf dog as well, but he's a bit of a scrappy bugger and if there's going to be a fight, you can pretty well guarantee Tony's going to be in the middle of it. This dog's name is Lennon. When he's hooked up on the on the rope, he never stops singing. He's imagine all the people. <laughs> we must be ready. The dogs are crazy to go. So is Crystal's new Sami outfit. So I keep them on now, <laughs> and I have a hood on it for uh, for wind. But the Samis never use a hood. They would have a separate. Hat made out of reindeer. These dogs are bigger, stronger and faster than the team I had on Svalbard. We literally take off. Dogs seem to time the bumps in the track, 
give a little extra tug, and all of a sudden, bang, you're airborne. Bang, you're airborne again. Sven's got this rule about not yelling out or making a whole lot of noise, so I can't go, yahoo, which is really what I want to do. So on the inside, I'm yelling, What a magical, magical place. We cross a frozen lake and into the forest to stop for lunch. I'm not sure how Sven tells the dry wood from the wet. Everything's covered in thick snow. But it doesn't take him long to get the fire going. Ham and cheese toasted sandwiches in the snow. What an exhilarating ride. The hills, I mean, some of the hills we'd come to and I'd look down and go, oh, no way. <laughs> Before you know it, you're off and you're down and the dogs are just giving it hell for leather and you, you've got to get down, you've got to keep your balance and, and the corners, oh, yeah, they take some getting around, that's for sure. It's pretty late in the day. And whatever sun we had, we're losing and it's getting quite a bit colder as we make our way <laughs> Man, I tell you, the days just keep on getting better and better. I don't know if that's just because um, I'm getting used to the dogs, or maybe the dogs are getting used to me. Well done. You almost kept me out of trouble today, didn't you? Hey? Turkey, one of the oldest permanently settled regions in the world, and renowned for its great hunting. My goal is to go on a night hunt for the Turkish wild boar in the central Anatolian plateau where boar have been hunted since ancient times. Having flown all night, first to Istanbul, then on to Ankara, by the time I get on the road to my final destination, Devrik, it's daylight. Logistically, this could be my most difficult trip. Outside of the big cities, not many Turks speak English, and my Turkish is limited just to a few phrases. We've just met up with Tolhut, he's our driver, and I think we're heading into Ankara maybe to, to pick up another guide, a hunting guide. Well, maybe we're not. Maybe we're actually heading out to the hunting area, which is a 300 kilometer drive. I'm not too sure. As it turns out, we did stop in Ankara to pick up Ison, who will be my interpreter. I was thinking we might stop there for lunch too, but no, we seem to be in a hurry. So next stop, Devrik. Or maybe not. Well, we just ran out of gas. <laughs> It's only 25 below outside, quite windy and cold, and we're in the middle of nowhere, so we'll be fine. Fortunately, our driver, Talhab, does seem to have a plan. <laughs> and that's to borrow money from Ison, the interpreter, and then flag down a passing stranger for a lift. You can go to the uh, gas station. <laughs> and he will come back. I don't know how. <laughs> After a bit of a wait, he does get back, and away we go again, into thicker and thicker snow. Turkey has two very different winter climates, mild temperate winters around the coastal regions and harsh long winters inland around the arid central plateau and mountains. Minus 30 to 40 degrees Celsius, with snow on the ground for up to 120 days of the year, is normal. And apparently this winter is the severest in 30 years, should make night hunting interesting. We make it to the town of Devrik. My first stop is at a tea house where I'm to meet my hunting guides. To break the ice, I buy them tea and try the universal greeting of cheers. Okay, not a great start. Maybe it's my hair. Can't have been anything I've said. Oh well, after my long trip, I'll be pleased just to get to the hotel. It's called an hotel, not a hotel. Yeah, I've seen all these signs. I thought the, I thought the H's had fallen off, but that's how they spell it over here in Turkey. So I'm going to go and uh, take my luggage up to my hotel room. Then I think I may have a long hot bath, Turkish bath. Well, 
Best laid plans and all that. No sooner had I reached my room when I was told, you've got five minutes to get your gear ready, assemble your rifle, and jump back into the truck because you're going hunting. Apparently we're going to be driving down this road for about 20 kilometers. That's what our interpreter said. But unfortunately, we left the interpreter behind at the hotel. I have found out the driver's name is Mr. Smile. Smile by name, smile by... Uh, no, it doesn't apply. About 20 kilometres later, we do stop in the middle of a field. But what for, I'm not sure. Test shift. Test shift. Oh, well, that's a relief. I was worried we were just going to rush straight off out and start hunting boar without my first having acclimatised to my surroundings or even sighted in my rifle. That's after it being in five pieces and bounced around in a luggage hold. Guys quickly slap a hand-drawn target on a tree. That's pretty much on the target. I would like to have aimed at something rather than just a blob, maybe something with crosshairs, just to see if you are to the left or the right, up or down. But everything seems to be in such a bloody hurry, so I'm, I'm reasonably confident with it. And this guy wants to get moving, so it looks like we're going to head off now. But head off to where? Once again, I'm completely in the dark. We now appear to be going in the direction of the hotel, so I'm guessing no hunting tonight. But then, ahead, we find Mr. Smile's larder, abandoned in the middle of the road. He spotted boar tracks in the snow. The tracks have turned off the road and up a farm track. So Mr. Smile and I follow them for about 20 minutes. With the light rapidly dropping from day to dusk, we spot first sign, then animals. There, a herd of wild pig, just foraging on the track ahead. Now, while I did say I wanted to go boar hunting, this is not what I had in mind. I want to track the boar, at night, through its natural terrain, finding out how it moves and thinks. Smile is urging me to shoot, but I decide to decline. Mr. Smile is not a happy man. This is really not what I was thinking it was going to be. It just seems to be such a rush. And got into some pigs. And uh, it's like, no, I really want to hunt one properly. Not just coming out here, rip shooting bus, and just shooting everything that you see. They've walked on ahead now, so I think we're going to have a little discussion. But to do that, we need to understand each other. I'd say right now these guys are highly pissed off with me. Why didn't I take that shot? It would be so much easier if I had an, an interpreter out on the hunt. Next morning at the hotel, I've asked the interpreter Ison to organise a meeting between myself and the guides to try to break down this language barrier. I'm going to need these guys to be on my side and I've got this feeling that last night they were maybe in their minds they were thinking you know this guy's a bit of a dick you know he's come from the other side of the world and doesn't really get hunting here in Turkey. Well I don't, I don't get it and um, but I'm sure they don't get me as well and what I'm after and it has to be more than just going out and shooting an animal it has to be something which is part of an adventure. I want to see and understand the animal's environment before I pull a trigger. It's so important to a hunter just to understand what he's hunting. Good night, good night, please. Although Mr. Arslan is a no-show, at least Mr. Smile is smiling. Uh, last night, I think that, um, that Smile was mm, a little bit angry with <laughs> the fact we didn't shoot the boar. He's a bit angry <clears throat> uh, because uh, he couldn't understand why you didn't shut mm. the boar. Because I really want to hunt a big boar. Inshallah. Yeah, I just found some zimbabwe. Inshallah means we hope. Inshallah. <laughs> God. <laughs> God. Yes. <laughs> And last night, it was a really big boar. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he, he was angry. I'm sorry. Oh, well, I spend a little time explaining the type of hunting I hope to do in Turkey, and I think we part on less frosty terms. 
That evening, Mr. Smile collects me for a night hunt. I'm sure on the inside he's pleased to see me. All the driving around here has done at breakneck speed. Even when you go through town, they have 50 kilometre speed zones. But we're doing 80 to 90, being overtaken by people. You know, in the snow and ice and dangerous conditions, but it doesn't seem to phase anyone. Foot down, let's go. We arrive just before nightfall and swap vehicles, jumping into the red terror, the larder. Then it's another long drive up a valley along tracks that look like all the others. A jackal crossing our path. Is that a good omen? At least it's a sign of life. Hopefully, with this time of night, which is the witching hour as far as hunting goes, we'll get to see a few more animals. The approaching night is quiet and still. And the temperature's about minus 20 degrees. I'm glad I've got the right gear for this sort of adventure. I've been following some footprints. The man looks like a sow and a young one. Perhaps I'll move out just a bit slow up ahead. And with any luck, there'll be a boar nearby. I can tell you, tracking wild boar in the dark is an exhilarating experience. Like the Russian boar, the Turkish boar can grow to be huge, up to 300 kilos. That's about 700 pounds. A very popular game animal in Europe. It's built like a tank, and it's fierce. It can absorb a bullet, turn, and charge the hunter at full speed. Mr. Arslan stops suddenly, and the camera bumps into my rifle butt, making a slight noise, which upsets our guide again. It seems he had found a boar, but the noise has scared it off. Hunting at night like this presents a whole new set of problems, and as quiet as you try and be, you've got these snow holes that you, you're falling into because it is dark, and you're not making a lot of noise, but it's just enough because it's quite a still night, and the, the animals are highly alert. They scent us, or they see us, extremely quickly. So this time out, we, we basically blew it, we might have another opportunity up here ahead. Or perhaps not, as my Turkish guides are sulking and have returned to the car. I trudge back to where we found signs of foraging and make myself comfortable in the snow to wait. I don't normally ever have a problem with the people I meet on my adventures. They are always as keen to get to know me as I am of them, and language and culture never seem to get in the way. But my Turkish guides don't seem to care either for me or the way I go about my hunting. Oh bugger it, I'm not going to stay frustrated. I'm a positive sort of a guy and I'm going to have fun. That's what I'm going to do. But just not tonight. Well, Mr Smile just came and banged on my door and uh, said he's had a call from a local farmer that's got a problem with a wild boar that's coming out of the forest and ripping up his garden. Could we possibly go along and help him? So we're jumping into the truck and we're tearing off. It seems like we're in a great big hurry again. I certainly don't mind giving a guy like this a hand and it's gonna be another adventure. When we arrive, both the farm and surrounding countryside look very familiar. And after transferring to the trusty larder and driving up the farm track, I'm feeling certain this is the same place I turned down that boar a few days ago or maybe the countryside just all looks the same. Wild boar can do considerable damage to farmland, destroying and eating a whole year's crop. There are also quite a few stories of locals being attacked by boars around this area. At one time, Turkey's economy was completely based on agriculture. And even today, farming still employs well over half the national labor force. Because of that, the control of wild boar is left up to the farmers and is allowed the whole year round. The guys have gone out during the week and fed up some spots to try and draw the boar off these ridges and down onto the tracks. The going underneath the trees and up on the ridges would be really hard going because the snow is so deep. So if we can pull them down here, then it gives us a better chance because travel underneath the trees it wouldn't be impossible, but it would be bloody hard. Somewhere in those trees is a big, mean boar. All we have to do is find it before it spots us. 
As night falls on the Devrick countryside, Mr Arslan and I have been searching for a couple of hours for the sign of the rogue boar. Further along, Mr Smile has been hunting off the track, into the fields, and he has found fresh footprints. By the size of the hoof, it's clearly a large boar, and by the time we catch up to Mr Smile, we think we might be really close. And there he is, right out in the open, across a field. I quickly set up for the shot, but can barely see my target. The spotlight. That's the camera's infrared light you can see, but I'm relying on a tiny amount of moonlight. My first shot is a little far back. Shoot. Man, did you see how fast that boar covered the ground between us? Thank you. Finally, I seem to have the approval of Mr. Smile and Mr. Arslan. That was pretty tough, man. I mean, I expected these guys to turn the light on, but it was no shoot, shoot, shoot. It's dark, I'm going, I can't really see the shoot. And then he turned, and of course things worked out. But uh, it's getting pretty, pretty exciting here for a moment. Man, I have to tell you, I actually began to think, oh, I don't, I don't think I'm going to manage to get one. And then finally tonight, here we are. And we're actually not too far from a road. We're only about a kilometre or two from a road, so. It's pretty amazing that they come down out of the forest and down here onto the onto the flats to um to forage for this feed. It's almost uh, the hunter's kindred spirit, and the, the boar is, is almost a part of me now. I guess you could say one of, one of the most amazing things just sitting here is the smell, and it's not an unkind smell. You know, often pigs and especially old boars, they'll they'll smell pretty gnarly, but it's it's actually quite a sweet leathery smell. I've never, never smelt that on an animal before. It's, it's quite a bit different. Hey. Nobody fancies carrying the 200 odd kilos of animal a couple of kilometres back to the car, so we'll leave it where it is to collect it tomorrow during the day. And in the light of day, there's no need to follow the farm tracks as we did in the pitch black last night. It's snow's nice getting pretty deep around here. And it's great to have the opportunity to push through virgin snow, to get a true sense of what the Anatolian countryside is really like. Those farm tracks all look the same in low light. Here's some fresh sign. Perhaps a new boar has already claimed the old one's territory. So he's come down this track, down to here. Has a look. look. Mr. Smile is a lot more talkative today. Strangely enough, I understood all of that. The boar comes out of the forest down here, comes and just sort of sits down here quietly by this tree, and he's just looking into this open space, checking for any signs of danger, no danger, using his snout, and sniffing the air, because that's one of, their, one of their, their biggest traits they've got, is that, is that huge nose of theirs, just sniffing, sniffing out what's there, and sniffing for food as well. And there is some food that we've been spreading out over here during the day, and he's come, smelt that, and then gone out. Wow. When we came here last night, I could tell that he was big. But being here in the daylight, he's massive. Look at this fur. Underneath the bristles, it's, it's not just more hair, it's actually, it actually looks like a possum skin. No doubt that's what keeps it warm during the winters. And look at the length of the bristles on his hump. They've got to be at least six inches long. And this is the business end of the boar, the tusks. This is what they use to defend themselves, to forage, to fight. Here we can see the, the grinder and the tusk. And they use the grinder to, to sharpen the tusk and this edge is razor sharp. And there's only so much of, of this tusk which is actually protruding and the rest of it's way back here in the lower jaw. Probably over two thirds of it is actually back in the, in the boar's jaw. But that is one sharp piece of machinery. Now that we've taken this animal, we'll set about dressing it. 
Turkey's predominantly a Muslim country, but there's still a large section of non-Muslims here. And they'll jump at the chance of getting some fresh wild pork. An animal this size, it's got to have around about 300 pounds or 150 kilos of meat. There's a long-standing joke about larders and the, the reason why they have a, a window warmer on the back is so that as you're pushing them, your hands stay warm. But the chosen uh, choice of vehicles around here, they seem to go just about anywhere. They push heavy snow, they're up and down some of these really, really steep hills. I've been pretty impressed to tell you the truth. Mr Smile does the business dressing the animal. Everyone's cheerful and friendly today. I reckon you could say hunting has finally broken down those barriers of language and culture. That afternoon I leave Devrik to spend a day in Istanbul before my flight. And I'm happy to see Talhab, the same driver we ran out of petrol with coming here. Hands on the steering wheel, optional. <laughs> here it is, Istanbul. Possibly the oldest permanently inhabited city in the world. Its origins go all the way back to 7 BC. And today its population is in the region of 15 million people and probably the same amount of cats. We've just climbed the Galata Tower and in front of me I have three main waterways, the Golden Horn and then this way the Bosphorus to the Black Sea and out towards the Sea of Marama. But across here is the old city and I'm looking on the, the biggest mosque in Istanbul, Suleymaniye. Istanbul is crammed with stunning mosques and while I enjoy a beautiful building as much as the next guy, when I go on an adventure, especially to a city as old as this, what I want most is to immerse myself in the local culture. And Istanbul doesn't disappoint. While there are plenty of examples of modern life, everyone carries a mobile phone for example, the lifestyle doesn't appear to have changed all that much. Hey, this looks like a great innovation. Never seen anything like that before. Mind you, I've never seen 10,000 people fishing off a bridge either. The guys have got all the bait lined up. It looks like shrimps, and the other one actually looks like sea worms. The range of seafood here is astonishing. Man, you should see the size of these prawns. You should hear the rumbling of my stomach. Hello. <laughs> A sardines or? Well, look, fish. 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 Perfect. Wow, I think that's more than enough. Mmm. This is delicious. <laughs> Only one more plate to go. I don't know what you do with the onion. No, no, you don't do that. You don't do that. Before I leave, I want to experience Istanbul's Grand Bazaar. Built five and a half centuries ago in 1461, and containing over 4,000 stalls, I reckon that makes it the world's oldest shopping mall. It's also the home of the world's craziest scar salesman. <laughs> well, I achieved my goal of hunting a wild Turkish boar. But what will really stay with me is how an adventure with a common cause broke through misunderstanding and cultural differences to leave me with a love of Turkey and the Turkish people. An old hunting mate of mine has invited me to help with the cattle muster on his farm in the Northern Territory of Australia. The locals call this huge area simply the Top End. And Conway Outstation is right on the edge of Arnhem Land, an Aboriginal reserve since 1931. It's taken me all day to drive from Darwin, down to the campsite where we'll start the muster from. But by the time I arrive, my host, Alan, has a welcoming fire going and steaks on the grill. It'll be an early night though, because tomorrow we've all got work to do and I can't wait to try some farming, Outback style. The smell of tea brewing on an open fire awakes me. That's Alan, also known as Snow. He's actually a Kiwi from Southland, but he wanted a new challenge so he came here to raise cattle. 
The Northern Territory of Australia covers over 1.3 million square kilometres, with a population of just 223,000 people. Conway Outstation is a relatively small operation, just 360,000 acres, but it's got no shortage of wildlife. Water buffalo, crocodiles, wild pigs, birds, dingoes, kangaroos, and wild cattle. Cattle were first introduced to the Northern Territory in the 1820s, and when a number of properties were abandoned, the cattle were let loose to go bush. They can be real bastards if they get among the domestic herd, but they're also a good source of income, and on horseback is still the best way to muster them. There's a lucrative market overseas for wild beef. That's because these feral cattle have been free-range grazing on natural bushland, shrubs and grasses throughout the Australian outback. No chemical fertilisers or sprays is a great selling point for the meat. One of the stockmen, Ben, has caught a mickey, so we'll tie it to a tree for a while and let it calm down before joining the herd. A mickey's a young wild bull that hasn't been in the yard or been branded or tagged. And they tend to be the troublemakers, need to be shown who's the boss. Many of these animals have never seen a human before, and it pays to be careful. Only last year, one of the ranch hands was badly gored, nearly killed by a young steer. These musters can last for up to two months. Once the wild cattle have been driven back to Conway Station, they're prepared for export to Asia. That was hot and dusty, but the reward is to sit around a fire and swap a few yarns with good mates. The remains of last night's fire has kept me cosy in my swag. I'll tell you what, these things are pretty darn comfortable to sleep out in the bush in, and there's nothing beats sleeping underneath the stars. No stars, sun's up, so there's no time for sleeping in. The first order of business is replacing 27 kilometres of fencing on the border of Allen Station, and by the time we arrive, the crew are already hard at it. The guy in the striped shirt is Alan's son, George. He manages the place. Real men don't use gloves. On the other side of the fence is the neighbouring station of Gundaloo. How big is Gundaloo? Um, it's over a million acres. I'm not exactly sure of the acreage. <laughs> So on this side of the fence, you're just a hobby farm really, eh? A bit of a lifestyle yeah. of 360,000 acres. Yeah. Around midday, the temperature reaches into the high 30s. So we break for lunch and there's no mucking about with these blokes. Steaks on the grill and the billy heating water for a refreshing cup of tea. When you put in the sort of physical effort these guys need to every day, a decent feed's required. They had meat for Smoko too. That's morning tea for those of you who aren't Kiwis or Aussies. Back to the fence line. George Allen and I start clearing a section of old wire that's been damaged by fire, ready for restringing. Bushfires here are fierce and they can last for weeks, covering hundreds of kilometres in a day. So that cleared area that looks like a road is a fire break to stop the inferno spreading. Man and machine working in tandem. You can do a lot of fence line in a day. <laughs> Saying that, my baby's just stalled. I'm waiting for a push from the grader. And on we go. They'll have the whole 27 kilometres finished by the wet season. Our section cleared. Alan and George are taking me off on another task. That is a hunter I reckon I'm pretty well suited for. The farm's been having a problem with a lone old buffalo bull, destroying fences and attacking the cattle. 
They have tried relocating him, but he's come back and so the final solution is to cull the animal. It's taken George no time to find him, and it seems none too worried by our presence. Unlike the Cape Buffalo in Africa, these water buffalo seem more curious and afraid. An air of arrogance even. And this one's allowing me to get pretty close. Just as I'm getting ready to shoot, the galahs spot me and spook the bull. A second safety shot to ensure a clean kill. Like the Cape Buffalo, these animals are incredibly tough. And they can appear to be dead, but as you get close, they can suddenly attack. Always approach with extreme caution. It may seem a bit hard on the old bull, but farming is about controlling both the land and livestock, and his life won't go to waste. During muster, we rounded up over a hundred wild cattle to be added to the domestic herd for sale overseas. In Australia, the mustard animals are referred to as a mob, and this lot now needs to be tagged, dehorned, and branded with the Conway mark. Once that's done, the livestock agents arrive to sort the cattle according to size and quality. Vital to the farming industry, the agents advise farmers on market trends and prices, and they can arrange penning, transport, auctions, and private sales. Hey, Steve, I'm David. How you going, Davey? I'm David, too. Hey, David, good name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and their services have been known to extend beyond just farming. There's a story of one agent who acted as the go-between for a farmer who wanted to get married, but was just too shy to propose to the woman. The transport is here to load the cattle. These double-decker multi-trailer trucks are the famous Aussie road train. These road trains are what keeps these uh, isolated communities going, basically. I think these guys are actually going to Indonesia. Australia has the largest and heaviest road legal vehicles in the world. The road trains recognised as an Australian invention designed to efficiently and humanely carry 100 cattle at a time. This two trailer one's a double, but they have triples and even quads. Pretty amazing that they can fit 102 cattle that size onto a truck. So. The last 12 go on, and then they're off and away, up to a waiting ship in Port Darwin. Outback George sends another load of cattle to Indonesia. I'm taking a break out of the fierce heat of the afternoon when George pulls up in another unique piece of Aussie engineering. This one's called a bull catcher, and he's going to show me how she goes. You ready to go catching bulls, Davey? I'm ready, mate. Jesus Buster. The bull catch is the perfect tool to capture aggressive rogue bulls and buffalo. This machine requires great skill and agility. The driver manoeuvres in close to the animal, then employs the hydraulically powered arm to collar it. Just back there. We don't have a bull that needs catching, but there's a group of buffalo cows that George can demonstrate on. It would be so dangerous trying to get this close on horseback. Got her! Works well on cattle too. Pure bloody adrenaline rush that made exciting as hell, but wasn't as rough as I thought it would be, you know? Yeah, a few yeah. trees and that for a while. I, I wasn't even hanging on. You weren't? Nah. <laughs> nah. Look. <laughs> George will let that buffalo cow go. Well, Alan takes me on my last job tracking a dingo that's been killing his calves. Feral dogs are more widespread in the top end and often give the dingo a bad name. The purebred dingo probably now only exists in the Northern Territory and because they're considered a native subspecies of Australian wolf, thought to be low in numbers, there's a ban on shooting them. 
there's some dingo tracks here. They like to travel the roads a lot. There's just about every road on the place. You see several tracks. There's been a dingo on them all the time. But you don't actually see too many. With all the long grass, they hear you coming and they're gone. I think most people wouldn't realise that, you know, that the old dingo is it's a predator. It's not just sort of running around eat, opening up cans of dog meat and, and eating them every day, is it? And certainly a calf like this would be, a, you know, pretty appetising for, for Mr. Dingo. For sure. And, you know, we seen the other day with the cattle in the yards, a couple of young calves with dingo bites on the back of the legs. We are actually allowed to poison them to get the right permits. We do that every second year, but you're not allowed to shoot them. We follow the dingo's tracks. If he's still nearby, we'll set a trap and Snow will relocate him. <sighs> These are what the, um, what the locals call arsenic berries. And uh, if ever you're wondering why they're called that, you can probably try one and see what happens. If you come across a berry and you want to find out whether or not you can eat it or not, you should just chew it a little bit and then stick it right up underneath your tongue. If after two minutes your tongue begins to swell up inside your mouth and your face goes blue and you're absolutely gagging for breath, then it's probably poisonous and you shouldn't swallow. There's no sign of the dingo. So Alan shows me the sort of special place that's unique to these desert lands. During the dry season, these cockatoo won't stray far from this billabong an oasis bursting with life. Very near this water supply is somewhere just as special, the remains of an Aboriginal camp. Aborigines have been in this part of Australia for a good 40,000 years, and Arnhem Land is well known for Aboriginal rock art. It's a real privilege to be shown a secret spot like this, I'm especially grateful to Snow and George for bringing me here. These paintings could be 200 or 2,000 years old. I reckon that one might be a fly, and maybe that's an upside down kangaroo. First time we drove in the air, it was just unreal, you know. It gave you a bit of a buzz. You can just imagine over on the other side here, sort of amphitheater type thing. You imagine all the chiefs and having meetings and over here looks like a playground for the kids. It's lots of rocks and caves and stuff. I wonder if they had any sort of like natural enemies or you know other tribes because this this is almost like a fortified sort of a ah yeah I guess. You can imagine getting up on top of those rocks you see for miles. See if the enemy is coming. Where the hell are we? <laughs> Probably the best known Aboriginal landmark in the Northern Territory is Uluru, or Ayers Rock. On the other side of these rocks are a number of caves, and inside one of them, the previous occupants have left something behind. As you can see, these people were hunters as well. And this is a, a little uh, gnat, um, it's like a flint or a stone spearhead. Well, it's time to leave not just this place, but also Conway Station. <laughs> you know, mustering those bulls in the outback has given me the crazy idea to ride one. Back home in New Zealand. It's just part of here showing rodeo activities are dangerous events and may result in very significant injuries. It basically means that anything can happen to you. A while back I was asked in an interview what was something I hadn't yet done that I'd love to do? And I blurted out, bull riding. Not long after that, Harkley Bull Riding School in the Manawatu rang to offer me a challenge, to spend a day with them, and at the end of it, ride a bull. Our instructor, Brad, is a genuine bull riding champion from Australia. And he's going to take our group of riders, young, old, some experienced, and a couple of complete beginners like me, through the steps of what it takes to get on a thousand kilos of ornery bull and try and stay on for at least eight seconds. The start is the most important part of your ride. I'm always saying, big start, big start, you know, like I want to get out there, I want to take the fight to the tiger. I want to see you do 110% effort. 
When you come to the shoot, you come in there like you're about to do some business. So I'll just get up like that. Always keep your hand on the rail when you're not using it. Because if that bull bucks in the shoot with you and goes whoosh go like that, at least you can stop yourself from going. Brad makes that look really easy, but there's a lot of questions floating around in my head like, you know, what happens if you get your legs crushed up while you're in the shoot? What happens if the bull really does buck while you're in the shoot? All of those sort of things. And you're sort of trying to figure out how you're going to plan for it. Well, you can't plan for it. you just got to go with it. And... and lay it down in front. That's how I take my wraps. Bull riding is right up there with the world's most dangerous sports. And the bulls have names like End of Days, Ribcage and Widowmaker. That's Roger. He breeds bulls specifically for their ability to buck cowboys off. I want a bull called Marshmallow. You want, well, we haven't got one called Marshmallow yet, Davey. From here to here, you're getting away from the power. Brad's using this funny looking bull to show us how to sit and maintain balance. This better be sinking in. Like that, and then he kicks. Bang, bang. One thing you do not want is what's called a hang up. I've had bullfights say, open your hand. Well, how can the hell can I open my hand when 70 kilos of me locked it on? And what I do, and I've always taught all my students, is to lock this hand over the top of their neck. You know, you can be bucking around with that bull like this, and if you're locked in there, he ain't gonna hurt you. Chaps, buckles, boots, rosin the rope, wrap the wrist. There's a lot to prepare. And a 70 kilo cowboy against a thousand kilo bull, well that's a big mismatch. We're coming up to the moment of truth now and uh, most of these guys have ridden a bull before. This is my first shot, so they don't seem all that nervous. In fact, they seem pretty excited about getting out there. Mm. Strangely enough, I'm actually looking forward to it. Yep, let's go. Get up, up, up. First out are the more experienced guys. First you've got to try and stay on for eight seconds, and then you've got to try and get off. Johnny, rosin up your bug. Well, you little hard. Heating up the rosin rope makes it, well, it makes it nice and sticky for better grip. Some of the riders here are seriously looking to go professional. It's the biggest buzz you'll ever feel. It's like riding a motorbike, but it's out of control. Then come the newer riders. This is Glenn. He's a first-timer like me. And the first hang-up of the day, but a clean getaway. Right now, this is subconscious to you. It takes 30 days to break a bad habit. It's going to take you every day of the week to get around doing that to break yourself out of it. Once you get that sorted, mate, your riding will just blossom. My first ride of the day is not far off. And the bulls seem to be getting stroppier. But check out young Charlie here. 14 years old, on a bull easily five times his size. It shows this sport's about mental, not physical strength. Great ride, Charlie. Well, time to do it. We've got the vest on, so I guess if I fall in the water, I'm not going to sink. My heart's beating like crazy. I try and remember Brad's instructions in the shoot. Heat the rope. Beat your fist tight into the handle. Sit as far forward as possible. Is that it? And then guys. it's now or never. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Good time to Dave. <laughs> You're officially a cowboy. <laughs> what was that 0.5 of a second? <laughs> it was all right, it was good. The whole thing was a total blur. I mean, I can't even remember a single thing about the ride, apart from all of a sudden being on the ground and then, you know, trying to climb up out of the rails. 
Now I have immense respect for these young cowboys. What they do, you know, get out there, get into a huge animal, thousand kilo animal, these skinny boys, and they ride it, they tough it out. They don't show any pain like us old bastards when we fall off. These guys, they're really, they've got some real depth of character and personality to them. And, uh, I'm just pleased that they've allowed me to come along and share in this experience with them today. And persistence pays off. Glenn finishes the day with a great ride. While I've been away roaming the world in search of adventures, my daughter Tegan has been back in New Zealand, gaining experience on a remote farm in the South Island. Wondering what she'd got up to, I headed down there only to find my girl down by the Makarora River, on top of a stranded pickup. In this part of the world though, we don't let these things worry us. We just send a neighbour's pickup over to haul it out, after a few attempts that is, and no one's bothered by a little bit of water in the cab, least of all my very good mate Mike King. <laughs> How are ya? Hey girl. <laughs> Ooh, good to see you. I love the South Island of New Zealand, and like many great places to travel, the journey itself offers just as much as the destination. This particular part of the mainland, as South Islanders love to call it, is the high country of Otago, and at the headwaters of Lake Wanaka, and on the edge of Mount Aspiring National Park. It's one of the most beautiful places I can think of on the whole planet. At Mount Albert Station, Mike manages the farming of horses, sheep, bulls, and a lot of cattle. I've known Mike for some time. While he's a bit of a mad bugger, he's also a bloody good cattleman. Mike's had no trouble keeping Tegan busy with herding, welding, crutching, and dagging. Now he's lured me up there to help with the annual cattle muster, which takes place just before Christmas. Hey, mate. I certainly don't need much convincing, not just because of this breathtaking location, but also because of the chance to be part of the unique teamwork of humans, dogs, and horses. The mustering crew will ride the horses up to Karen Fork's hut. We will stay overnight before beginning the muster the following morning. But Mike has a nifty way of getting all the gear up there, up the Wilkin River by jet boat. How many life jackets do you need out, Mike? Yep, that'll be a life jacket for just the one passenger. You know, Mike may be losing his hair, but the brain still works. No hours in the saddle for him. As beautiful as it is, this has always been a hard country. In the 1900s, loggers went into the native forests using ox teams to drag felled trees down to the riverbed before the spring tides. When the flush came, the logs would be floated out in rafts. This was a highly dangerous endeavor. Spring tides can be unpredictable and many young men lost their lives trying to get those rafts down the river. Well, thanks for that, mate. That was bloody awesome. Well, five hours in the saddle, and um, I'm still standing up, so that's not too bad a sign. I've got what an amazing country to come through. Just all those river flats and the beautiful snowy um, passes that you come through. Absolutely fantastic. What do you reckon, buddy? <laughs> oh, hey, wasn't that one of the most awesome, awesome rides? No, that was amazing. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the muster tomorrow. Looking forward to getting back on the horse. I'm not too too achy breaky. What about you? No, that'd be good. Yeah? Yeah. All that's left for today is a good feed. And out here, they like their protein. They say men can't cook. No, I've never seen one starve to death yet. No. How did you guys get up here today? Didn't There's no much. better way to end a long day in the saddle than with a feed, a fire, and a yarn with your mates. But it'll be an early night, because tomorrow, there's work to be done. Well, it's early morning, just after five, and the crew's all up. I guess it's an early start when you're on a muster. 
going to be a great day, eh? It will be a meet. Yeah, it should be quite hot on the time we hit the yards. Well, you can see the sun just rising up on those snow peaks now, so, yeah, I think we're, we're in for a cracker. I'll go and settle up. Mount Albert Station spans over 12,780 hectares of spectacular Otago farming land. It's a large scale sheep and cattle farm, running approximately 13,500 stock units. To the west of the property, glaciated valleys reach up into the high country to touch Mount Aspiring National Park, a world heritage area. Our job today is to round up the few hundred cattle that have been grazing on the flats and foothills along the Wilkin River. There are over a thousand beef cows on this property, along with four and a half thousand Perindale ewes, plus a few steers and the bulls. Once we've got the cattle down onto the river flats, it's a pretty simple job of forming a line of dogs and horses and driving the herd along in front of us, across the Macarora and back to the Mount Albert holding paddocks. The dogs do most of the work, dashing back and forwards and heading off strays, even collecting up the odd stray sheep. Which means I can sit back and appreciate my good luck to be born in a country that gives me the opportunity to live this life. These animals will be exported for beef to markets like Japan and Europe. Well, that's the end of the muster. We've got all the cows in and all the calves. I don't think we lost any. There might be one or two stray calves, but I think we've got the majority of them. It was one hell of an experience, one hell of a challenge as well. Thanks, mate. Really enjoyed riding you today. You played up all the time. <laughs> Woo boy, that'll do. With just a week to go before Christmas, Mike decides it's the right time for an end of muster staff Christmas party with a traditional barbecue and not so traditional skeet shooting. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mike's got a pretty interesting technique, it's all grace and style. <laughs> well, we're off on another adventure. This time it's fishing on the wild west coast of the South Island. And no, it's not whitebait. I'm going out to deeper seas to drop a line for bluefin tuna. But there'll be no sailing today, not in this weather. This is the infamous sandbar across the mouth of the Grey River. And it's been claiming boats and lives for as long as people have lived here. Since the Gypsy in 1863, 45 boats have been wrecked off this unforgiving bar and 17 people have drowned. This memorial lists their names and unfortunately, I expect it will be added to over the years. As evening sets in, the sea calms, but come the next morning, the waves are picked right back up again and my skipper Tony has to make the call to stick or go. It is coming and going, there's some quite reasonable sets coming through. There's good gaps where it's nice and easy to go and then there's other times where there's some quite heavy bits of water coming in and you've got to be pretty careful. At times you look at it and think, geez, we're not going there, you know, and at other times it's, there's some good lulls and you can get out, you know, so it's just, you've got to be careful and that's where a bit of uh, local knowledge and, and experience helps out. Tony has decided it is OK to go, so first mate Ant gives a safety briefing to myself, my son Tavis and brother John who are coming out with me. Slight movement of the boat can offset your feet and over the side you go. Anchors away. It's all calm in the harbour. But as soon as we get past the seawall and onto the bar, it gets a bit hairy. This is what the locals call a gentle swell. While the waves aren't that high, they do pitch and roll the boat in all directions. Through the bar and out to sea. By the time we arrive at the fishing site, it'll be dark. 
Having safely made it out to the Hokitika Trench, where commercial trawlers fish for hokey, the boys throw my line in, using the same fish as bait. The bluefin will be attracted to the fish in the nets of the trawlers, and I settle in to wait. But not for long. I've got a strike, and out goes the line. Now the game of playing the fish begins. He's powerful, but I get it to the surface with surprisingly little struggle. And I'm thinking, the bluefin's reputation as a fighter is a typical fisherman's exaggeration. Until my fish suddenly dives and breaks the line. All I can do is wind in and wait to try again. Bluefin are the largest of the tuners, and Pacific bluefin are the most common in these waters. Atlantic and southern bluefin have been commercially overfished, almost to the point of extinction. So we'll only take one or two and tag any others before releasing them. As dawn arrives, my brother John takes the chair to try his luck with the tuna. And wouldn't you know it, he hooks a big one. Tuna are a real sports fishing challenge. They will dive deep when hooked, and they can fight for hours. The record for this boat is five and a half, and longest on this fishery, approximately 20 hours. It takes John about an hour and a half to get his fish near the boat, and he takes his time to work it to where the crew can haul it on board, because there's family pride at stake, and he's dead set on doing better than his older brother. Success, and it's an absolute beauty. Should weigh around about 250 kilos, and will make plenty of fat, juicy tuna steaks for family and friends. Commercially, about 80% of Pacific and Atlantic bluefin are consumed in Japan. And ones that are particularly suited for sashimi and sushi can reach extremely high prices there. In 2012, a 222 kilo Pacific bluefin was sold in Tokyo for the equivalent of 1.76 million US dollars. Ants cast a new line for me, but it's drifted under our boat. I'll need to wind her in before it can get tangled in the prop. The trick to this type of deep sea fishing is to cast the line out alongside the trawler as it passes, so the bait drifts by the net of hokey being hauled up. The tuna come from as deep as 500 metres to get a free meal and hopefully go for the hokey that's sitting on my hook. Bluefin have incredible eyesight and it's crucial to camouflage the hook with the bait. They're also perfectly streamlined which makes them fast. Bluefin tuna have been clocked in excess of 48 kilometres an hour. No wonder they can burn out a reel that's not solid enough for the job. Well, I guess the fishing gods are just not smiling on me this trip. I've come away empty handed, but that's actually not such a bad thing. At least I know there's still tuna out there, and John's magnificent catch is plenty big enough to share. There's many great ways to eat this meat, and my favourite is in a Thai green curry with sticky rice. Those of you who have gone forth to catch your own tuna, call the terror of the Greymouth River Bar and a small shudder will run down your spine. Just taste the tuna. Brother, it was all worth it. All the Kiwi ingenuity, vacuum sealing all my survival gear. There's a raincoat, a pair of pants, Not bad. Actually, um, looks almost good enough to eat. And what's all that ingenuity in aid of? Well, throughout my 40s I kept promising myself that next year I would train for and compete in the famous coast-to-coast -coast mountain race across the South Island of New Zealand. But I never quite found the time to do it. Then, I was invited on a kayak trip with good mates Andy Macbeth and Bob Foster down the Holyford River in Fiordland. These guys are world-class adventure racers. And if I'm not going full noise, you just, you're just going to sort of mirror what I do. If I start putting power in. 
the boys regaled me with stories of great adventures, rivers with killer snags, of murderous logs and deadly whirlpools. You get in your boat and the water's pushing your nose around straight at that cliff. They showed me the way to enter the river's flow, how to port the kayak across land and through bush. I loved every minute of it and wanted more. So the boys set me a challenge. Why don't you enter the coast to coast? Yeah, bloody oath. I've turned 50, now's the time. You shattered? I knew how to run and I knew how to cycle, but I needed to master kayaking. I went to Lake Horofanua, where I'd set out early across the misty waters, cruising past a relic of paddlers from another era, invigorating in more ways than one. So after months of training, I find myself in the truck with my partner Maggie, heading down to Kumara on the west coast of the South Island. And sure enough, the weather's shite. The coast to coast began in 1983, and the basic concept is simple. Start from Kumara Beach on the west coast, then multi-sport your way over land and river for 243 kilometers until you reach Sumner Beach on the east coast. Easy. Yeah, right. Competitors cycle 140 kilometres over three stages, run 36 kilometres, including a 33 kilometre mountain stage that crosses the Southern Alps, and then kayak 67 kilometres along Grade 2 Waimakariri River, all for a metal disc. I just wanted to check off this morning that I had the, the, the lepins and the EMS bars and protein bars. Having made it to our base in Kumara the day before the race, the first job for Maggie and I is to shop for all the nutritional supplies I need to power me through the race. Do okay. you want muesli bars, power bars? A list carefully compiled to a scientific dietary formula. Jet planes, lollies, licorice. Here's my lollies. The secret with jet planes is get as many purple ones as you can. My other essential is tea. I can go a long way for a long time if I know there's a cuppa waiting for me at the finish. Job done. Enough food to feed me and my support crew. Now, for a little personal grooming. I'm going to have my feet and ankles strapped for support, and smooth skin will make the tape's removal a lot less painful. Oh, West Coast weather, eh? Well, that's sunshine. Mike and Tegan have driven up from Mount Albert Station to be the backbone of my support crew, and I'm really pleased to have them here. Next order of business is to shoot over to the competition headquarters to sign in, so the organisers know I haven't lost my nerve and gone home. As I queue up with the other entrants, I feel a surge of camaraderie. They've come not just from all over New Zealand, but all parts of the world, and I'm stoked to be one of them. It feels like I'm uh, standing in the queue waiting to make a bet. I bet that guy Hughes doesn't win the race. Five dollars on that. Good mate, good, how are you? Um, I'm uh, 394. Well, if I could finish 394th out of 800, I'd be happy. Taping's next. Done this before? No, first time. What, strapping or, or, or the coast to coast? Both. Yeah, first time for both actually. Right. You want to just explain what's the, the merits of strapping? You know, am I going to receive any benefits from it? We find that people that have got an underlying weakness in particular in their ankles get a considerable more support. It's like an external ligament um, so that when they're going over wet and slippery rocks and they're tired or the end in particular, they don't do themselves lasting damage which will stop them completing the next day or the next phase of the course. Here was me thinking you're just going to give a yes or no answer. Sorry. <laughs> As the day wears on, Kumara is filling up with new arrivals. Competitors, support crew, and spectators all here for the one goal. That evening, there's a gathering of competitors and crew in the local school hall. This is the safety briefing for the race. Held by the indefinable Robin Judkins from Christchurch, creator of Coast to Coast, and much more than just a race director. So I'm sitting in my 
lounge window watching the competitors run down to the beach and I've got a row of bums facing me. Hello, somebody standing up the front with an inopportune question. Yes, um, it's Danny Hughes. Yeah, uh, Mr Judkins, I, I've um, inadvertently uh, left my uh, cycling helmet in the North Island. Oh, stop all those who are outside. Danny Hughes has left his feet. The man has got longer hair than I, and he's just about to be just told that he's inadvertently left his cycle helmet in the North Island where he lives. But um, I was coming through Greymouth, and I noticed um, you know a lot of possums on the side of the road, and I, I grabbed one of those, and then... Uh, <laughs> This is a West Coast version of a striking helmet, which is in fact a fully fledged possum of the female variety, it looks like to me. Too soon, the day of the race has arrived. I've just wandered down here onto the beach this morning. This is where it starts. That's why they call the race the coast to coast. And I've come down to um, pick myself up a wee pebble. I'm going to carry it over the Southern Alps and down through the Canterbury Plains out to Sumner on the East Coast. So then I think I'll hip it into the ocean over there and join these two seas together. At the start line, it's a chilly, nervous wait in the grey morning light. The first batch of competitors ready to pit themselves against the mighty coast to coast. Time to rock and roll. Let's go and get this thing done. The first leg will be a quick 3k run. And I'm just soaking up the vibe at the start line. When suddenly the horn goes and we're off. Time to rock and roll. Last week I'd finally got myself organised and ready for the famous coast to coast multi-sport race in the South Island of New Zealand. The course starts on New Zealand's west coast at Kamara Beach and finishes 243 kilometres later at Sumner Beach on the east coast. The event's broken down into cycling, running and kayaking stages and is over just one day for the professional competitors but split into two days for amateurs like me. In a big bunch. After the 3k run, I'd love to get on the back of this peloton and let them tow me the remaining kilometres of the bike stage. At the transition point, there are already scores of competitors fueling up and setting off on the mountain section. I'm still pedalling, and Team Swazi's looking a bit nervous. But here I come, two and a bit hours in, now on to stage two, the mountain and goat pass. Once you miss that bunch at the front, then it's, it's basically 55k on your own, and it's, it's a bit of a grunt. And uh, typically the only people you're going to haul in are the people that, um, that can't help you anyway. For the pro athletes and serious competitors, the coast to coast is a race, with a winner and a record time to challenge. But for those of us mere mortals that enter, it's more a test of character than a test of strength. We're about four kilometres into the run, but for me this is where the run proper starts. In the first three or four kilometres, my, my legs actually were, were feeling like lead and in the last few hundred yards they've been feeling like jelly so I'm kind of hoping that by the time I, I hit the bush they'll be feeling like, I don't know, coconuts. All the way up there is my destination, Goat Pass. To get there I must make my way up the Deception River. It's not all travel up the river, there's quite a few of these benches along the, along the side of the main route so you sneak through, you can gain yourself a little bit of time across. For another hour, I crisscross the twisting river. Really hoping uh, not to make a fool of myself and fall in the water here. <laughs> the smell of sulphur. Must be near Sulphur Street. Or Break Ankle River. Once we start heading up into that Tuscan Alpine, it's 
up onto the pass and then pretty much downhill. Not that downhill's any easier, but just that you're over halfway then. It's, it's a mental thing more than anything. Well, a couple of hours into the run and uh, still a couple of hours to go up to go past, so it's important to keep hydrated, just keep a bit of fuel going. As I get higher, my legs and lungs feel as if they cannot possibly take any more. I start to hear a voice in my head telling me, it's too much, it's okay to give up, no one will think the less of you. But then I remember, if I don't finish this stage, I'm out of the race, and I would think the less of me. I'm reminded of a famous Winston Churchill quote that I think applies here. If you're going through hell, keep going. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Well, the pass is in sight. Thank goodness for that. Well, it's taken us four hours to get up here, climbing up through the deception. We've got a short, sharp grunt up here, and it's pretty grunty, let me tell you. Really looking forward to bursting out on top, though, and having a look down into the minger. If it's a good day, I've got a feeling we'll be able to see almost all the way down. And finally, six hours into the race, I hit the pass. Welcome to Go Pass. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. <laughs> Mr. Halfway, halfway, halfway. <laughs> well, this is Go Pass. We've got the east coast, the west coast. I'm standing roughly in the middle. Uh, it's pretty much downhill from here. We've got a rendezvous with a great big fillet steak and some pasta, a little bit of Genoese and a nice glass of Pinot waiting. So it's down, down, down. Down towards the Minga River, trying hard not to break a leg. It's certainly doing my knees no favours. I stagger my way stiff-legged along the river, those knees now screaming for mercy. But there's only this hill, known as Dudley's Knob, left to conquer, and the worst will be over. I'm buggered. Well, that's Dudley's Knob. That's the last high point for me today, because the car park's just down below me, I can see it. It's still quite a few kilometres away, but I can see it. And it's downhill from here. One more stream to ford, then up onto a dry, flat riverbed. Goat Pass now just a memory, 15 kilometres behind me. And coming towards me, I spy not a mirage, but the very welcome sight of Mike and Tagan. Done it! And I'm not last. I empty the tank so I can end the first day running across the stage finish line at Klondike Corner, where a very juddy sort of a welcome awaits. Welcome to Klondike. Hi. Whoa! Oh, Whoa. Oh, Whoa. Oh, <laughs> holy mother! <laughs> just ran all the way and didn't get wet. <laughs> and here you are. Come on in. Well, that was a wee bit longer than most of these other guys, but I'm really pleased with it. You know, just to finish, just to come up and run down there, it was really emotional. What I would like to do is just have a massage, have a decent cup of coffee, and a good lie down. <laughs> I'm sure it's healthy. <laughs> Actually, it feels good. It feels really good. What isn't so good is the forecast for tomorrow. A humongous weather bomb is heading this way, and when it hits, it will be big. Day two of the coast to coast, and the predicted weather bomb has hit. The kayak stage down the Waimakariri River has been cancelled, but a longer bike stage will go ahead. We'll be heading off at one minute intervals, and uh, I'm soaking wet, and we haven't even started, but what the hell? You're going to get wet today, there's no two ways around it. The weather shows no sign of improving, which means the cycle start is now delayed. Yeah, so we're not, leave, we're not leaving too late now, you heard that. Yeah, I heard that. So it leaves late 30, so we'll be there till 10.30. There's little anyone can do, 
except take care of the necessary. But finally, the rain eases enough for the day's race to begin. And wouldn't you know it, soon after we leave Klondike Corner and get onto the flat of the Great Alpine Highway, the weather turns dry and warm, really warm. Soon the wet weather gear I piled on is just draining precious energy, slowing me down. Well done, guys. And when I spot Tegan up ahead, ready to hand me fresh water, oh, he's gonna stop. I decide to stop and rearrange my attire. And there's no time for privacy. Got to get these thermals off. Poor Tegan. Then it's straight back into it. Here we go! Because of the weather, this cycle stage is now 140 kilometres. After that will be a final short kayak stage down the Avon River in Christchurch. And that's it, job done. But what I don't know is up at the stage finish at Hagley Park, there are not only supporters and crew waiting for us, but a big surprise as well. Just found out they've changed it again and he's got a kayak and then a ride. So we're running around trying to find out where we pick him up from, how far he's got to go. Very good. I arrived to find organised chaos. The team Swazi have quickly adapted to the changes and already figured out a plan. I'm in good hands. The last 25k it was just like, God, long strokes, when's this going to end, you know? Suddenly you start to see suburbs and a bit more civilization. And uh, when you finally hit the town, it gives you such a great big lift, you know? Okay, so there's yet another cycle stage after this. I just focus on getting a clean start in the kayak and ignoring the pain. All those early mornings I put in training on Lake Horofanua are now going to pay off. This will be about speed rather than the skills of negotiating the Waimakariri Rapids. But the Avon River is like molasses in the winter. There might not be rapids, but there's a headwind, tide and shallow stretches where I run aground more than once. I'm very conscious of the need to leave something in the tank for that final cycling stage coming up. By the end of the kayak, I'm running at about 509th place, and I promised myself that I'm not going to finish a race any lower than that. Just one more stage to survive. On the bike, I give it everything I've got and catch a few in front of me. And there's the finish. I made it. I was just so determined on that last wee spot there that no one was going to pass me and beat me, so just really put it in. I think that was probably on a stage. The icebreaker tent will show you so all proud. the wonderful warm merino. What, what else can I say? I'm pretty cut up now. <laughs> well, it seems like a lifetime ago. But it was only yesterday morning, cold and dark, that we were standing on the beach at Kumara on the west coast. And that was the beginning of our journey. There's probably only one thing left to do. I say goodbye to my west coast rock. But that doesn't mean we'll be saying goodbye to the West Coast, not just yet. To reward myself for finishing the coast to coast, I've hooked up with a few mates, including Ted the dog, to head to the remote Martins Bay area on the southwest coast of New Zealand. There, you'll find misty valleys full of care and simple huts nestled in the native bush. And you're sure to find a group of blokes studying a map and planning a deer hunt up the Hollyford River. You gonna come for a hunt, eh? There are four of us on this adventure. See you in a minute. Shane and Steve are off to check their whitebait net at a nearby lagoon. Andy and I decide we'll take the scenic route along the coastline and meet them there. And we needn't worry about whether there are deer about. That's pretty fresh, that's right beside the hut here. I'd say that's last night. We need Carney, follow it up. It would be pretty cool to have Carney here. He was my tracker in Tanzania, and I wonder what he'd make of this very different landscape. Over the dunes, and we're in Martins Bay. 
Man. Imagine, uh, you know, Brunner and, and Ethan and all those other explorers, you know, the first time they came across the divide and they, and they saw this. Deer on the beach. That's, um, that's always a good sign if uh, you want to come down and bring your, um, your deck chair and a bit of suntan lotion and your rifle. Just sit up and wait for them. The only other visitors to the beach right now are a couple of oyster catchers. Andy, also known as the Gnome, is a mate who introduced me to kayaking down the Holyford River. And to return the favour, I'm going to act as a guide on his first deer hunt. But this afternoon, we'll just enjoy the sights of this untouched piece of paradise and check out the boys' white baiting net. It looks pretty good. We've got a few in here. The guys have just done a bit of a test run here. Is, is it a good spot, Bob? Yeah, we've only had it in a couple of minutes and we've got um, a paddy already. <laughs> That's not too bad. White baiting is strictly controlled in New Zealand. Nets can only be out during the daylight hours and need regular attention, but worth it if it means white bait fritters. Having done a bit of scouting for deer sign, we call it a day and head back to camp. We've been promised something special for dinner. Fresh crayfish and power. If you've never had this Māori delicacy, it's a flavour quite unique. Chop onions, mix with minced power, cook it all up, then serve. Crayfish with Mornay sauce. It looks pretty good. And power fritters, five star food. I walk off dinner down onto the beach to make the most of this isolated seascape. The west coast is a wild place. On a day where the storms roll, it takes no prisoners. But on a day like today, it's one of the most stunning vistas in the whole world. And tomorrow, there's hunting. Gnome's big day, and the two hunting parties are up with the birds and off. My plan is to take Andy along the beach to Goody's stream, then turn up into the hills. But first I want to sight in my 300 Kimber, so I fire a couple of shots at 100 metres, then zero my scope. That one here was cool. Nothing a quick adjustment can't fix. And before we move on, time for a brew. Oh. Can't beat a cup of black billy tea over a fire in a riverbed. My Kimber 300 WSM is the perfect travel gun for all large or tough game animals, from bears to mountain goats, no one's going to use it on this hunt because this old 303 that I'm carrying couldn't hit a barn at 20 yards. We tramp for about an hour up through some of the most stunning native bush, wading through clean, sweet mountain water and shaded by beautiful punga ferns. We've climbed up this wee creek quite a way, but it's time, I think, to head up into the scrub because there's a bit of a saddle up above us. So we're going to head up through this uh, wee deer trail here. Um, we had a look yesterday, at, just scouted around the edge of it. The first half hour is pretty thick giggy and supplejack, so I think that first half hour is going to be pretty tough going. And it sure is tough going. But at the top, we're rewarded by the find of a stag's private lounge. Lovely wallow here for a stag, and he's, he's got his pad down here. He's got a great view of the ocean. Long view here through the scrub. This, if I was a stag, this would be my home ground. Just check out that ocean view. The stag lives like a millionaire. Although the maid seems to have taken the day off. We keep moving along the ridge till we hit the saddle. I make the call to cross to the next ridge, where there appears to be less thick scrub and foliage. Hopefully up there we'll have better visibility ahead of us. Hunters are always concerned with the wind, and that also seems to be in our favour. With no natural predators, deer have thrived in New Zealand, spreading throughout both the North and South Islands. Well, 
travel up here on the on the ridges is a lot more open. It's actually really good going too. We've, we've cranked it along up here, so we're up basically on the top where we want to now have a look at uh, heading down onto the other side and down into that main river. This is what hunting is all about. It's not just necessarily taking an animal, but it's to walk the wild places and to view these lofty mountains. It's, it's taking in the whole experience. It's, it's real hunting. We work our way across and down a steep slip to get to a spot just below us where there's an excellent vantage point to view the whole river valley. Better unchamber that round, Gnome. That was a fantastic shot. A clean hit 300 yards through dense trees, and the deer wouldn't have felt a thing. I'm thrilled to have been a part of Andy's first deer. Now all we have to do is find it. Oh, here he is. Just drop down the steeper. Go ahead and roll all the way, Davey. Is it a spiker or a hide? Fine, lad. Fine. Great shot, mate. <laughs> We've only got about half an hour of light left, so let's um, let's get the next part of the job done and, uh, and get our um, asses off this hill before it gets too dark. Get home for a beer. Absolutely. Well, another late night after a long day on the hill again, and. Uh, and he got his first day today, which is a, a really special occasion. And I'm, I'm just wrapped that I was able to be with him, and uh, we might have a few celebrations as well tonight. And Chris and the deer, how's that sound? Too right. Yeah, so, uh, hooray. Time Woo! to get out of these clothes. It's 20 past 11, so that has been a long day. So we're heading inside for a, for a cold one. Over the last nine weeks, I've covered thousands of kilometres, travelling the globe in search of adventure. And man, I've certainly found it. From the heat of Africa to the permafrost of Svalbard. From alpine and temperate rainforests to fjordlands, even the deep blue sea. I've been in pretty much every kind of environment this planet has to offer. But my best memories will be of the people that I've met, and of course dogs, their friendship, knowledge, humour and willingness to come along for the ride.